Good evening. We will now begin the webinar. Today is October 6, 2021, and the time is 6.02 p.m. This webinar is being livecasted and recorded and will be available publicly on the MTA YouTube channel and the Central Business District Tolling Program Project website at new.mta.info forward slash project forward slash CBDTP. By attending this virtual webinar, you are consenting to be recorded. Today's webinar will begin with opening remarks followed by a presentation on the Central Business District Tolling Program and then public comments. Only those who signed up to speak in advance will be able to give public comments. If you've joined the Zoom under a name that is different from the one you used when you signed up to speak, please identify yourself in the Q&A function with the name you used when you signed up. Anyone who joined the Zoom may also use the Q&A function throughout today's webinar to ask questions or provide comments. Cart captioning and American Sign Language interpreters are available at today's webinar. We will now start with opening remarks from Dr. Allison Desireno, MTA's Deputy Chief Operating Officer. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us this evening. We're excited to be engaging in public outreach for this historic project. And we thank you for taking the time to learn more and share with us your thoughts and comments. Joining me today are colleagues from New York State Department of Transportation and New York City Department of Transportation as well as from the Federal Highway Administration, the lead federal agency for the project. We also have several individuals from our respective staffs here with us to listen to what you have to say. Your comments will be indexed and considered as part of the environmental assessment process. So with that, let's jump right in as there is a lot to cover. Our agenda for today is to review the proposed program, the project purpose and need, discuss the project alternatives, provide an overview of the environmental assessment, and discuss and describe environmental justice considerations. We'll take a few moments to talk about the potential project effects and benefits, and then have a public comment session. So how did we get here? There's been a decade of congestion. Congestion in New York City has consistently ranked among the worst in the United States. Local bus speeds in Manhattan are on average 7% slower than citywide speeds. Between 2010 and 2018, travel speeds decreased by 23% in Manhattan's Central Business District, or CBD. And during that same period, multiple studies and panels explored how best to address congestion, including the 2008 New York City Traffic Congestion Mitigation Commission and the 2018 Fixed New York City Advisory Panel. Many of them came back with the same concept of congestion pricing. There is also a need for sustainable funding source for transit. Prior to the pandemic, nearly 75% of trips into the Manhattan Central Business District were made using transit. 95% of trips to the Manhattan Central Business District by low income populations are made using transit. MTA subway system is over 100 years old and must be repaired and modernized to meet the region's needs. And funding transit modernization would improve service and attract commuters back to the system, further reducing congestion. In April 2019, the New York State Legislature passed the MTA Reform and Traffic Mobility Act. If approved by the Federal Highway Administration, this act would entail vehicles entering or remaining in the Manhattan Central Business District to be tolled. Net revenues would be used for public transportation capital projects, with 80% devoted to New York City Transit, 10% to the Long Island Railroad, and 10% to Metro North. The toll rates will be determined by the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, or TBTA Board informed by recommendations of the Traffic Mobility Review Board and after a public hearing. There are mandatory post-implementation reporting and evaluation requirements. To make sure everyone understands the area about which we're speaking, Central Business District Tolling Program Boundary is south of and inclusive of 60th Street. Tolls would not apply to vehicles that are solely using the FDR Drive, Route 9A West Side Highway, including connections to the UL Carry Tunnel, or the Battery Park underpass connecting the FDR Drive and Route 9A. The Federal Highway Administration will serve as the federal lead agency for environmental review. They are responsible for reviewing all of our analyses to confirm that they are complete, and they will also issue the environmental findings for the project. The Metropolitan Transportation Authority and its affiliate, the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, the New York State Department of Transportation, and the New York City Department of Transportation are serving as project sponsors. With respect to the project purpose and need, 
project purpose is to reduce traffic congestion in the Manhattan Central Business District in a manner that will generate revenue for future transportation improvements pursuant to acceptance into the FHWA's Value Pricing Pilot Program, or VPPP. The project would address the following needs. Reduce vehicle congestion in the Manhattan Central Business District and create a new local recurring funding source for MTA's capital projects. The following objectives further refine the project purpose. It would reduce daily vehicle miles traveled, or VMT, within the Manhattan Central Business District. Reduce the number of vehicles entering the Manhattan Central Business District each day. Create a funding source for capital improvements and generate sufficient annual net revenue to fund $15 billion for capital projects for the MTA Capital Program. And establish a tolling program consistent with the purposes underlying the New York State legislation entitled the MTA Reform and Traffic Mobility Act. So how is the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, and the project linked? NEPA requires federal agencies to assess and consider the environmental effects of their proposed actions prior to making a decision. The project would be implemented through the Federal Highway Administration's VPPP. As a federal program, that VPPP, or Value Pricing Pilot Program, is subject to NEPA. Federal Highway Administration is the lead agency and has determined that an environmental assessment with extensive outreach is the appropriate level of environmental documentation for this project. There are two project alternatives. There's the no action. There would be no central business district tolling program, no comprehensive plan to reduce congestion in the central business district, and no identified transit capital revenue stream. And there is the build or act alternative, where we would build a central business district tolling program. There would be new tolling infrastructure and toll system equipment, implementation of a tolling program, which would have multiple scenarios in the environmental assessment to assess and identify the range of effects, positive or negative. And there would be creation of a new revenue stream for investment in subways, buses, and rail. A little more detail on the proposed central business district tolling program alternative. As noted earlier, tolls would be charged for vehicles entering Manhattan south of and inclusive of 60th Street. Passenger vehicles would be charged once per day, and there are exemptions required by the MTA Reform and Traffic Mobility Act for qualifying vehicles transporting persons with disabilities, qualifying authorized emergency vehicles. Central Business District residents with gross adjusted incomes below 60,000 would be eligible for a tax credit. And there would be a Traffic Mobility Review Board that would be tasked with recommending to the TBTA board the toll structure, including but not limited to a plan for credits, discounts, and or exemptions. Recommendations will be informed by a traffic study and must take into account multiple criteria, including the ability to generate revenue required, the impact on traffic patterns and volumes, public safety, air quality, among others. With respect to the toll, the environmental assessment is going to assess a range of scenarios and will be informed by robust public outreach. Studying multiple scenarios ensures that we understand the full range of potential environmental effects, including but not limited to congestion reduction that different toll rates may cause. Toll rates will differ in each scenario depending upon the time of day, how someone pays, and the inclusion and extent of any credits, discounts, and or exemptions beyond the two mandated by the enabling state legislation. Importantly, all else being equal, the more credits, discounts, and or exemptions that are given, the higher the toll must be in order to meet the project's purpose, needs, and objectives. The modeling is not complete and a final determination of the toll rates will not be made in the environmental assessment. Indeed, the toll rates as noted previously will ultimately be set by a vote of the TBTA board after the environmental review process and after the traffic mobility review board makes its recommendations. So importantly, these numbers I am about to share are for informational purposes and subject to change. With that said, to give you at least a sense of the range of potential toll rates, we anticipate that the easy pass peak period toll for automobiles will range from roughly $9 on the lower end to $23 on the higher end if many credits, exemptions, and or discounts are provided. The range of potential toll rates for automobiles using tolls by mail would be higher, roughly $14 to $35 for the peak period, again, depending upon scenario. Off-peak and overnight toll ranges may be lower, and tolls for trucks and other vehicle types would have different ranges. With respect to the study areas, the broad study area for the environmental assessment includes a region of 28 counties throughout New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. There will also be more refined local study areas, including the Central Business District, as defined by the MTA Reform and Traffic Mobility Act, in other words, 60th Street and Inclusive and South, 
with those other areas excluded as we described earlier. And neighborhoods near the central business district boundary where the project could have social, economic, or environmental effects. In terms of the key topics of the environmental assessment, this is not the full list, but we wanted to at least give you some sense of the kinds of things we'll be studying. Among them, as you can see, regional transportation, which is obvious, we'll be looking at highways and local intersections, commuter rail, subways, and buses, parking and pedestrian and bicyclists. We'll also be looking at social and economic considerations and conditions. We'll be looking at the visual resources, air quality, noise, and environmental justice, among others. Environmental justice is an important consideration for the project. Given that over 51% of the population within our study area lives in environmental justice communities, we're going to spend some time walking you through the federal requirements to address environmental justice and some of the tools we'll be using to engage with environmental justice communities. The term environmental justice refers collectively to minority and low-income populations within a project study area. In 1994, President Clinton issued Executive Order 12898 which requires federal agencies to consider the effects of their actions on environmental justice communities. In subsequent years, the U.S. Department of Transportation and the Federal Highway Administration have issued their own orders on environmental justice. Our environmental assessment must comply with all of these orders. The orders provide that Federal Highway Administration take the appropriate and necessary steps to identify and address disproportionately high and adverse effects of federal projects on the health or environment of minority and low-income populations to the greatest extent practicable and permitted by law. This slide shows the steps we'll be using in developing our environmental justice analysis. It is based on guidance developed by Federal Highway Administration and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. As you can see, we begin by identifying minority and low income or environmental justice populations and environmental justice communities. We engage within outreach with those communities, as you can see by the little picture on the right. We then determine whether the project would result in adverse effects on environmental justice populations or communities. We consider mitigations for those adverse effects of the project, as well as potentially offsetting benefits to the affected environmental justice populations. Again, there's outreach and engagement during that process. If the effects remain adverse after mitigation, we identify disproportionately high and adverse effects. If there are no disproportionately high and adverse effects, the evaluation is complete. If there are disproportionately high and adverse effects, we evaluate further mitigations or alternatives to avoid or reduce those effects. The Federal Highway Administration Environmental Justice Order provides specific definitions for minority and low income populations. As you can see here, minority is defined by U.S. Department of Transportation and the Federal Highway Administration as a person who identifies as Black, Hispanic, or Latino, Asian or Asian American, American Indian, Alaskan Native, Native Hawaiian, or Pacific Islander, or individuals identified as some other race by the U.S. Census. Low income is defined by United States Department of Transportation and Federal Highway Administration as a person whose household income is at or below the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services poverty guidelines. For a family of four, the 2018 U.S. Census Bureau poverty threshold was $25,750 for the study area. Based on the definitions in the previous slide, we have identified the environmental justice populations in our 28 county study area. As noted earlier, and as you can see in this table, over 51% of our study area population is considered minority and over 13% is considered low income. This map shows the distribution of environmental justice populations throughout our study area. The map shows large concentrations of environmental justice populations in New York City and the immediately surrounding suburbs. There are also large concentrations of environmental justice populations throughout our study area. Our public outreach will engage with these communities as much as possible. One way we'll be engaging with the communities is through the creation of an environmental justice technical advisory group. This is a group of technical experts who have knowledge of environmental justice considerations and can share concerns drawn from throughout the study area. The group is comprised of community leaders, advocacy group representatives, and industry group representatives with specific interest in environmental justice considerations. Their purpose will be to identify concerns and mitigation if needed and help to ensure information is circulated as widely as possible to the larger communities. The technical advisory group will be by invitation only, and we anticipate the first meeting convening in early October of 2021. Potential participants will be contacted in advance. 
We will also be creating an environmental justice stakeholder working group. This is a group of interested members of the communities throughout the study area who would also like to participate beyond submitting comments or participating in the webinars. This group will be comprised of interested members of the community, and the purpose is to share concerns and request discussion on particular issues as appropriate. To suggest yourself or someone else, you may visit our website, or you may com to complete a form, or you can contact us by phone at 646-252-7440. We anticipate that the first meeting of this group will be convened in early November of 2021. And again, once we have all the names and contact information, participants will be contacted in advance. We're gonna review some of the potential effects of the project. Importantly, these effects are dependent upon scenario. The next slide will highlight some of the potential benefits, but I'll take a few moments to talk through the bullets here. We anticipate that there may be effects where there would be no tolling infrastructure and equipment, that there might be changes in traffic in neighborhoods near the Manhattan Central Business District, and that there might be traffic that diverts around the Manhattan Central Business District to avoid tolls. Again, dependent upon scenario. Near the Queens Midtown Tunnel and the Hewell Carry Tunnel, we anticipate some traffic diversions on the highway system that could result in more than a nominal increase in traffic. Preliminary analysis suggests this change in traffic would not occur on local roadways and would not adversely impact air quality or noise in the neighborhoods where the highways are located. However, we will be looking more closely at the neighborhoods adjacent to both sides of these tunnels. Some drivers currently travel through Manhattan, although their destination is elsewhere. For example, you may travel from New Jersey to Brooklyn or the Bronx by going through Manhattan. Preliminary modeling indicates that some of these drivers may change their routes and traffic may increase in certain locations depending upon scenario. We will be looking more closely at the extent of those increases in parts of Staten Island, Brooklyn, Upper Manhattan, and the Bronx, and whether they could result in notable changes in traffic, air quality, or noise. Preliminary analysis also indicates that new transit passengers who may take transit rather than drive will be spread throughout the transit system and will not overcrowd any particular route or line. Based on preliminary analysis, the shift to transit would not notably change access to transit, transit services, or pedestrian circulation near transit stations and hubs. In terms of tolls on low-income and minority populations coming to the Central Business District from throughout the region, a direct effect of the project on residents of the Manhattan Central Business District who are part of an environmental justice population is that they will be charged a toll to drive into the Central Business District. However, the MTA Reform and Traffic Mobility Act provides a tax credit for those individuals whose primary residence is within the Central Business District and whose New York adjusted gross income is less than 60,000 per year. Preliminary analysis has found that fewer than 1% of the Manhattan Central Business District's commuters are low-income individuals who drive, but nonetheless, we are assessing the economic effects of the additional costs for these customers. Tolls on the taxi or for hire vehicle industry which has a high proportion of workers who identify as minority as defined by United States Department of Transportation guidance are also being looked at. Industry data shows that a high percentage of taxi or for hire vehicle drivers identify as belonging to a minority population. Once there is a new toll for entering the Manhattan Central Business District, some passengers may no longer choose to use taxis and for hire vehicles. We will examine the effect of the project on the taxi or for hire vehicle industry and the resultant effect on minority drivers. With respect to potential project benefits, if approved, we anticipate the project would reduce vehicular traffic in and near the Manhattan Central Business District. Overall, and depending upon scenario, our models predict a 15 to 20% reduction in traffic volumes that would enter the Manhattan Central Business District each day. As a result, we would see improvements in air quality and traffic noise as there would be fewer vehicles. We also anticipate improvements in travel times within the Manhattan Central Business District, again, as there would be less congestion. And of course, the project would provide additional funds for subways, trains, and buses, funding the MTA capital program, which includes many projects to improve and expand subway, bus, and commuter rail service. This would benefit MTA's transit commuters, including environmental justice populations. I wanna take just a moment to discuss or describe the anticipated NEPA schedule. We've already begun our outreach. That's what we're doing here today. And we anticipate that this outreach will continue through January of 2022 as we also prepare the NEPA environmental assessment. Between February 2022 and May 22, 2022, there will be review with Federal Highway Administration of the document itself. And at the end of that period, the environmental assessment will be made available for public comment. Once the document is made available for public comment, there will be a public review period and a new comment period. 
That period will also include additional outreach related to toll rate ranges. Between that June 2022 date and December 2022, the work will be done to incorporate all of that information to make sure that the final outreach is done and ultimately to have Federal Highway Administration make an environmental determination. If approved by Federal Highway Administration, future outreach and public hearings will be held as part of the implementation and traffic mobility review board process during 2023. Here is the list of all the public outreach webinars we are holding. As had been noted in the distribution materials prior, you may attend any one of these or all of these as you would like. We also have the three environmental justice outreach meetings, webinars. Those will be occurring on October 7th, 12th, and 13th with slightly different focus areas. But again, as with the public outreach meetings, residents may attend any one of the webinars they would like to. In terms of our stakeholder working group meetings, we expect the first one in early November, the second one in late November, and then we expect a third one in June of 2022 once the environmental assessment has been released for public review. Thank you. We will now move to the public comment portion of today's webinar. We encourage anyone joining via Zoom or live stream to take a short survey using the QR code or link currently being displayed. The link can also be found in the Q&A section of the Zoom. We're gathering public comments today to inform the environmental review process. Comments will be reflected in the environmental assessment once it is made public. Rather than responding to comments as they are given, we will do our best to address specific questions whenever possible in the Q&A chat function. However, please understand that at this phase of the process, your question may be one that cannot be answered meaningfully until completion of the modeling and analysis. Anyone who has joined the Zoom may also use the Q&A function throughout today's webinar to ask questions or provide comments. We will be calling speakers who live in the geographic area that is the focus of today's webinar first in the order they signed up. Please note that each speaker will be limited to two minutes. There are a large number of speakers signed up this evening and in the interest of time and respect for all other speakers, we ask that everyone keep their remarks to the two minute time frame. Due to the large number of speakers, we may go over our scheduled time, but everyone who signed up will be called to speak today. If you do not want to wait to be called, you may send us comments directly or sign up to speak at one of our upcoming webinars. For more details, please visit our website at new.mta.info forward slash project forward slash CBDTP, post in the Q&A function on Zoom, or call the public meeting hotline at 646-252-6777. Card captioning and American Sign Language interpreters are available at today's webinar. Only those who signed up to speak in advance will be able to give public comments. If you've joined the Zoom under a name that is different from the one you used when you signed up to speak, please identify yourself in the Q&A function with the name you used when you signed up. When you're called on to speak, there will be a brief transition on your screen. Please make sure that once your screen updates, your camera and microphone are enabled before beginning your remarks. You will not be able to unmute or enable your camera until it is your turn to speak. Please remain patient until then. In the event you miss your name being called, we'll call the list one more time after all speakers in attendance have been called the first time. As a reminder, this webinar is being live casted and recorded and will be available publicly on our YouTube channel and our project website. By attending this virtual webinar, you are consenting to be recorded. We will now begin the public comment portion of today's webinar. Our first speaker is Assembly Member Linda Rosenthal, followed by Senator Robert Jackson. You may begin your remarks. Okay, can you, um, I just have to get something. Can you stop it? I just have to get, um, okay. Can you restart it? I'm ready now.
Thank you. Uh, I'm Assembly Member Linda B. Rosenthal. I'm Chair of the Committee on Social Services. I represent the 67th Assembly District, which includes the Upper West Side and Hell's Kitchen. I am happy we finally arrived at this moment. I was a supporter of the first congestion pricing plan back in 2007, and I'm proud to be a co-sponsor and voted in favor of the 2019 state legislation to authorize congestion pricing in New York City. Um, Okay. Um, we know that here in New York City, a typical passenger vehicle emits 4.6 metric tons of carbon dioxide each year. Um, it's, it's no wonder that passenger vehicles are responsible for more than 25% of New York City's total greenhouse gases. Because of the high concentration of cars, New York City ranks among the top cities in terms of ozone and PM 2.5 pollution, which increases our rates of asthma, lung cancer, and developmental delays in children, and more. I represent West 60th Street and the areas north and south of it that will become the new border of the CBD. My constituents who live in and around the CBD are concerned that their neighborhoods will be transformed into parking lots as motorists implement individual park and ride schemes to avoid paying the congestion pricing toll. I strongly recommend that the DOT conduct a study to investigate the impacts of congestion pricing on parking noise and congestion in the areas immediately bordering 60th Street. It's also vital we make protections to ensure drivers are only charged once per day. For people who are unable to access uh, our transportation system, uh, we created exemptions, but we should create similar exemptions for seniors with mobility impairments, people with chronic terminal and other serious medical conditions, and those with temporary disabilities for whom public transportation is inaccessible. Uh, congestion pricing without an income. Okay. We need an upward adjustment to the $60,000 exemption for people who live within the CBD. And I urge that this income-based exemption be pegged to inflation so that we need not revisit and debate the merits of the exemption each year. I also recommend taxi and for higher vehicles um, be, in, be considered so that the congestion pricing does not decimate the industry. Uh, I have much more to say, but I know my minutes are over. So I urge uh, that we have a wonderful design and implementation of congestion pricing, but take into account other options uh, and put someone from Manhattan on the board because this will affect Manhattan uh, Thank you. in a great way. Thank you so much. Our next speaker. Will be Madison Thomas on behalf of Assembly Member Rebecca Seawright, followed by Senator Robert Jackson. You can begin your remarks. On behalf of our constituents of the Upper East Side, Yorkville, and Roosevelt Island, thank you for the opportunity to submit testimony to raise concerns of my con constituency for the implementation of the Central Business District Tolling Program. It is true that we have a dueling traffic and transit, transit crisis and the congestion pricing plan promises to reduce Manhattan traffic, improve air quality and boost revenue for our mass transit system. The legislation passed with the state budget in 2019 requires the Traffic Mobility Review Board, TMRB, to advise on the price of tolls and potential exemptions but it's not yet established. The legislation required at least one representative from Metro North and Long Island Railroad regions, but not a representative from Manhattan, even though congestion pricing will be implemented in our borough. Manhattan deserves representation. We are acutely focused on the need for Manhattan community representatives on this board and have made our requests signing on to a letter to the governor with my fellow Manhattan elected officials. Furthermore, I support the resolution of our local community board eight in calling for the appointment of two community representatives from Manhattan to the TMRB. We are asking for representation to make constituent voices heard on exemptions which are critically needed and consequential to the affordability of living in our neighborhoods. Although congestion zones is below 60th Street, Residents living in our district north of 60th Street or living on Roosevelt Island will inevitably have to travel through the zone 
if they want to cross the Queensboro Bridge or travel into the Central Business District. Constituents' feedback has been a frustration that their needs as people living in the Upper East Side, Yorkville, and Roosevelt Island are being ignored. Appropriate consideration for credit- Please conclude your remarks. Disc discounts and exemptions for populations unduly impacted by the tolling, the tolling program must be made for Manhattan residents, seniors, and our disabled neighbors. We are hearing from many people that they need to get to their medical appointments at facilities in the central business district. The doctors- Thank you. Our next speaker will be Senator Robert Jackson, followed by Andrew Fine. Can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, I'm Robert Jackson. I represent the 31st Senatorial District from Marble Hill all the way down to Chelsea, 26th Street and 9th Avenue. And I am concerned for my constituents, especially near the George Washington Bridge and anywhere above the, the zone in order to basically turn our neighborhoods into parking deserts uh, from people that are coming outside uh, of, uh, of our area. But also, <clears throat> With respect to that, I was in favor of congesting pricing because it will bring billions and billions of dollars to improve the MTA, both subways and the bus systems. And quite frankly, we need to do that so that people will get out of their cars and, uh, and get on the subway system that's going to be you know, fast, uh, clean, efficient, and safe. And that's what people want. Uh, so I support it wholeheartedly, but obviously I have issues and concerns about uh, the neighborhoods that I represent that will be turned into parking lots for people that uh, are coming in from out of town. But also there's carve outs obviously that people are gonna be looking for. So I'm hoping that we have someone from Manhattan on uh, looking at the interests of Manhattanites, but doing what's right and fair for everyone. And so with that, I just say, hey, let's keep moving. Let's get it done. Let's bring in the monies in order to get the MTA or where it's supposed to be. And for me, the most important thing is safety and security of the people that I represent that are riding the system, whether it's the bus or the trains, and making sure that they're clean and uh, get us where we're going. So we have our job, we collectively have our jobs in front of us. And as a legislator, I'm gonna try to do my job in trying to make sure that things go right. And I ask the MTA board to do the same thing. Thank you very much. Have a good evening and I'm gonna listen. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Andrew Fine, followed by Daniel Cohen. Hi, folks. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me. Um, I hope this works. Um, am I on? We can hear you. Okay, terrific. Andrew Fine from the East 86th Street Association. Um, regarding congestion pricing, we find this uh, proposed program as classist, regressive, anti-family, anti-senior, against people with disabilities, and it places a greater burden on the Upper East Side, the Upper West Side, uh, as collateral damage than any other neighborhoods that are considered in this effort. Uh, the collateral damage that we're seeing um, despite the modest improvements in congestion in the zone, we feel that above 60th Street, uh, within uh, probably a couple miles in the entire island for that matter, uh, that we'll, we're going to see an increase in congestion, in pollution, in noise, in lack of parking. Uh, we'll see an escalation of already exorbitant garage rates and additional crowding on mass transit. This um, will be onerous to people that live on the Upper East Side. It's not the $20 fee uh, or the $30 fee or the $40 fee. We don't know what that'll be. Uh, but what it is to us is the collateral damage. In terms of arguments that I've heard against the, uh, oh my goodness, am I that, down that far already? Bottom line is that rich people are not going to have a problem with this fee. It's going to, unfortunately affect people that are poor and middle class, and it will be um, disproportionately effective to uh, people that are in that 
uh, income range. And I thank you for your time. And I'm sorry for the emergency vehicle in the background that distracted me. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Daniel Cohen, followed by Valerie Mason. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hi, I live in Manhattan on 87th Street, and I strongly support congestion pricing. And not only that, I'd actually love to see it expanded to all of Manhattan. Um, like most people who live in Manhattan, I do not own a car. I primarily get around by walking and taking public transit. And when I do, cars are a major negative for quality of life. Cars emit pollution, they're loud and noisy, they're a danger to pedestrians. And reducing the amount of cars that drive into Manhattan will be great for quality of life. Uh, one thing I'd like to emphasize is please do not exempt anyone from it. Manhattan has fa fantastic transit and fantastic walkability. Um, it is the best place in the entire country to not own a car. You don't need to own a loud, dangerous 2,000 pound land shark in order to get around. So please do not exempt anyone from it because the, the whole point is to reduce the amount of cars. So exempting people defeats the whole point. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Valerie Mason, followed by Dante Nicoyello. Valerie? Yes, I'm here. Thank you for Maybe that. Please begin. Oh, sorry. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I am the president of the East 72nd Street Neighborhood Association. Uh, in its current form, we cannot support congestion pricing. I want to echo many of the comments that were made by Andrew Fine, the president of the East 86th Street Neighborhood Association. Congestion pricing has nothing to do with reducing congestion in Manhattan. If there were a real effort to reduce congestion, the first thing we would see would be the elimination of parking placards. This would reduce uh, the great number of cars that are coming currently coming into the city. It is an outrage that people who reside on the island of Manhattan have to pay to use their own streets. There is no similar program anywhere in the United States. If you live in a beach community in Nassau or Suffolk County, you have a beach pass to use your beach and everybody else has to pay. Why is it, why is it in Manhattan that people who live in Manhattan would have to, be, to pay to use their own streets? It is also incredibly discriminatory for the elderly and disabled, of which there are many of those older people and disabled in, in our community. We have some of the best hospitals in the world that are in this community, and to, to have to pay extra, that is just an outrage. The last thing I want to mention is we were talking about economic justice. Right now, there's a congestion pricing tax that only affects people who live uh, below 96th Street. And when we come back from, uh, from the airports or wherever we're going, we are the only New Yorkers who have to pay extra to get back to our homes. It's an absolute outrage. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Dante Nicolello, followed by Charles Gross. Hi, good evening. First, we know vehicles in Midtown and Lower Manhattan during the day are met with major congestion delays. So most vehicles are from those who do business in the district or need their vehicles for work. Most workers use public transportation. If the goal is not just a scheme to raise money for a bloated MTA bureaucracy and is truly to lower congestion, then the price will have to be set high enough to discourage a large percentage of people from doing business in the district, so high that it becomes unprofitable. We are probably looking in the range of $7,500, $100 per day. The reality is a high percentage of small business businesses and workers who use their vehicles will have to be priced out in order for this to work. Big corporations and the wealthy will be unaffected. Where is the equity? And what about their customers who live and work in the district? They will be underserved. Second, throwing more money at the MTA bureaucracy is rarely given with strings attached. During COVID, Congress gave the MTA $4 billion and the MTA lowered service the next week on the Long Island Railroad. 
video show Chuck Schumer was outraged, but his mistake was not making the funding contingent on service. Shame on him. In a Village Voice article a few years ago, the MTA was caught red-handed, intentionally slowing down trains by installing unnecessary timers, while at the same time asking for more money to address overcrowding. After the scandal was exposed, Andy Byford put in a program to bring train speeds back up, but this has been implemented very slowly, and there are still many areas where trains are slow because of unnecessary timers that are still have not been removed. Any funding to the MTA should have strings attached or money will be wasted on vendors and consultants. The MTA doesn't deserve a dime unless they can guarantee needed service levels. Having the MTA run this program is a complete conflict of interest because the organization is a beneficiary of any money from drivers and there's nothing to prevent them from maximizing revenue regardless of service improvements. This congestion plan is just a money grab from small businesses and underserved communities outside the district. The congestion is a result of Please decades of neglect on remarks. roads and bridges and the lack of planning. The last Hudson River crossing was more than half a century ago. Any politician or appointee, especially those from outside the district, Thank should be you. concerned about their re-election prospects if they have not spoken up in opposition. Thank you for your remarks. Our next speaker is Charles Gross, followed by Carl Mahaney. Good evening, Charles Gross. Upper West Side, I would like to know why we, the New York residents, who are the highest tax people in the country and pay among the highest tolls, if not the highest tolls in the country, are being told that our spendthrift government needs yet more money to do what they should have been doing already. Congestion pricing will neither solve congestion, nor will it solve the problems of the MTA. Bridge tolls in Manhattan, New York, doubled over a 10-year period. We didn't get improved subways, and we certainly did not end congestion. If you want to end congestion, you have to improve mass transit. To do that, we have to stop spending, as the New York Times has noted, five times what every other city in the world, France, Paris, LA, spends on track, on laying tracks. We have to stand up to the corporations. We have to stand up to the unions. Our politicians have to use the money we are already sending them. New York City is the cash cow of the state. It's not that the money doesn't exist, is that the will of our politicians do not exist. So how do we improve the subway? How about this? Let's make the mayor and the city council and all our city leaders and our state leaders ride the subway five times a week and give up their cars that we provide for them and their parking privileges one week a month. I guarantee that that will improve the subways. If you want to stop congestion, stop taking parking spaces away. They're needed. Stop taking streets away to for cafes right next to parks. If you want to encourage carpooling, set up an app similar to what we have for, say, YouTube. Give uh, bridge discounts if you have three or more people in the car. People will give up their cars or you or carpool with others, not when you make it harder to use them, but when you make it easier not to. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Carl Mahaney, followed by Megan Martin. You are currently muted. Sorry. I live in Manhattan on the west side above 60th Street, and I strongly support congestion pricing, and here's why. Cars kill cities. They kill people through traffic violence and chronic health conditions caused by air pollution and noise. They kill relationships, including those never formed for lack of social space to mingle. They kill the freedom and development of children who from the earliest age until they're almost adults must be protected from a constant lurking threat the moment they leave their building. They kill the ability of our aging neighbors to participate in society, turning a simple walk to the store into a dangerous and intimidating act resulting in fewer walks, fewer social interactions and greater isolation. These are the social costs of driving. They're not always easy to measure and are too often not even considered but remember them when drivers accept exemptions, uh, request exemptions. Remember the kids living across the street from each other who never even have the chance to meet because of stored and speeding cars keeping them apart. Remember the grandmother living alone, choosing not to leave her home because the last time she tried, she was bullied by an impatient driver using her neighborhood as a shortcut to their own. Remember the adult with chronic asthma, unable to fully participate in the activities they choose thanks to a lifetime inhaling particulates 
from automobiles. Remember the loved ones lost to the simple act of crossing the street, leaving families grieving. Congestion pricing alone won't solve these problems, but it's an essential tool toward more livable and humane streets. History is clear on cars and cities. They are simply not compatible. We New Yorkers live this reality every day. Please implement congestion pricing quickly and with no new exemptions. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Megan Martin, followed by Seth Hughes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so I'm not a lobbyist. I am a parent of two small children. I am also an, a, an anesthesiologist. I'm a physician that works in Manhattan. And so I'm gonna speak to those two principles. I live on the Upper West Side. And um, so when we speak about uh, public health and public safety, this cannot be any more against those two principles. Um, number one, you will not have an increase in ridership on your subways because congestion pricing will not fix the problems that we currently have in our uh, subway system with our safety issues. People are not riding the subways because you do not want to be assaulted on the subways. The subways have emotionally disturbed individuals that are not being addressed by our current policies. Um, second of all, uh, in one day you may have a perfectly healthy life and the next day you may discover that unfortunately you're diagnosed with cancer. And that actually is a situation that my family found themselves in um, where we where I had to uh, go to Memorial Sloan Kettering for chemotherapy treatments for extensive surgeries. And so when the previous speaker is describing how cars are somehow, you know, assaulting people, um, actually cars are what brought my spouse back and forth to his chemotherapy. So these exemptions, um, no one knows when they're going to need an exemption. And the fact of the matter is that it goes against all sort of rationale to say that people do not need to use a car, need to use a vehicle. We use vehicles all the time to have to transport our family for a variety of reasons and to discriminate against taxpayers who already pay the highest taxes in the entire country to use our own streets, our own facilities is highly discriminatory. And what you will do is drive out families and taxpayers out of New York City and you will have no one left. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Seth Hughes, followed by David Vassar. Um, thank you for giving the public an opportunity to voice our opinions. Uh, I live on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Cars take up too much space and are dangerous for pedestrians and cyclists and also cause air pollution. Existing road taxes do not cover all maintenance and upkeep of the heavy wear that automobiles cause and certainly do not cover medical conditions or deaths caused directly by accidents or indirectly through air pollution. Cars are a burden on limited city space, air quality, and climate change, and congestion pricing will help alleviate the streets of downtown Manhattan as well as provide funding for mass transit. More time stuck in traffic and fewer people walking around is also bad for businesses. Lower income areas will benefit from more reliable mass transit as 95% of trips into the central business district are already taken on mass transit. We saw with the 14th street busway that when car access was restricted, instead of clogging nearby streets, more people took the bus. When London implemented congestion pricing, businesses did not suffer and it accomplished its goal of reducing trips made by private cars, leading to less congestion and more trips made by public transit and cycling. I want to strongly encourage the MTA to limit the number of exemptions made and to implement congestion pricing as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be David Vassar, followed by Anita Goodridge. David? Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay, thanks very much. Appreciate the opportunity of the, these conversations. Uh, my name is David Vassar. I live in Morningside Heights. Uh, first of all, I really want to just echo all the sentiments of my Morningside neighbor, Carl Mahaney, a few minutes ago, that was very perceptive and, and echo my own thoughts very much. Uh, congestion pricing, I agree. Revenues from this, from this program absolutely have to be effectively spent. I mean, there is validity to the charges of, uh, of waste, um, misspending, misappropriation of, of funding, and it's and it's really it's really essential that we get this right. Um, in addition to upgrading transit, let's and, and especially especially let's make upgrades which will allow those who are physically disabled to any extent to use transit comfortably and conveniently. Um, I also would really like to see some of that funding, some percentage of that funding go toward the upgrade upgrades to cycling infrastructure. Uh, I'm a 65 year old cyclist in the city. Cycling has kept me young, uh, but only because I have not yet had a too close encounter with one of the many SUVs that are clogging our streets. Um, and, and to that point, uh, we're seeing larger and larger vehicles out there all the time. Uh, they're just they're just proliferating. Uh, people have, have seemingly caught uh, the SUV bug in, throughout America, and that that infection is, has hit New York as well. Our Vision Zero mayor, uh, really, I totally agree with the speaker who said that our public officials need to set the example to take transit too. Um, smart cars, let's let them in at a much reduced rate. Things like Escalades, Tahoes, uh, and, and multi-tonners like this have to pay the, the full price. And let's do encourage a car pulling as well. Let's incentivize it uh, any way we can, including with reduced fees. Uh, Thanks very much. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Anit, uh, Steve Chasen, followed by Andrew Rosenthal. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Steve Chase and I'm a lifelong New Yorker. My children are fifth generation New Yorkers. My family has lived in New York City continuously for 120 years. I've lived on the Upper West Side for 20 of those years. I am opposed to this congestion pricing plan, but uh, being a lifelong New Yorker cynic, I'm fully confident it's gonna go through regardless. My concern is the location of the toll at 60th Street. What this means for those of us on the Upper West Side and Upper East Side is that 79th Street here becomes last exit before toll with a super high toll. What we know is that drivers from out of town are going to pull off the highway into our neighborhood to try and avoid that toll. Anyone who's seen this in other highways knows this to be the case. Thousands of vehicles will take this exit, which cuts directly through Riverside Park, which is crowded with elderly, with cyclists, with joggers, and with young children. We know that deaths on the roads here in the city have gone up exponentially recently. This becomes a very, very dangerous situation for a residential neighborhood that cannot take this volume of cars. We know these people will be crowding the neighborhood, circling for parking that doesn't exist, ruin the quality of life in the neighborhood and put our residents at risk. The simple solution here is to move the toll a few blocks south on the West Side Highway to 56th or 57th Street. Cars can exit at that point into a highly industrial area. There's a Department of Sanitation Depot there. There's a cruise ship pier there. Get the people to the exit the highway in a neighborhood that can take this level of traffic, keep them out of a beautiful residential neighborhood, a seven-way exit in a park, keep our residents safe, and keep our neighborhood beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Andrew Rosenthal, followed by Ryan Finley. Hello, am I live? Yes. Okay, my name is Andrew Rosenthal. I li also live on the Upper West Side. I'm actually right next to the exit 
And but I do support, unlike the prior uh, caller, I do support congestion pricing. I was born in New York. I think New York is a great city that could be made greater, and congestion price is one part of it. Uh, we need to get the congestion pricing in and reduce the number of cars. And if we do nothing else, then get police out of the cars and back onto mass transit. We had callers saying that the subways aren't safe. I think the subways are safe, but they'll be even safer if all of our uh, police and firemen are actually taking them to work every day. So I support no exemptions, no exemptions, okay? Uh, Vision Zero combined with congestion pricing does work. So at a minimum, let's try this. This has worked in Oslo and Helsinki. They had lots of pedestrian and cyclist deaths just like we have here in New York City. They implemented congestion pricing and Vision Zero and they got to the zero goal in 2019. So let's try it. This is not something that we can't undo if it doesn't work or we can't tweak it. But if we don't try it, we won't know how good it's going to be. So please, please implement it as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Brian Finlay, followed by Joel Ettinger. Am I, am I on? Yes. Okay. Hello, I'm Ryan Finley. I'm a resident of Carnegie Hill on the Upper East Side, and I'm a supporter of congestion pricing, but not necessarily the version that's currently being proposed. Um, so far, I've been hearing a lot of people that are, uh, they own personal vehicles, and they're very concerned about how they're going to be dealing with a, a shortage of parking. Uh, honestly, parking wars are nothing new for this city. People have been dealing with a shortage of parking for, I mean, is, at least as long as I've been on the earth uh, and probably far longer. Um, cities like London and uh, Helsinki, as, as has been previously mentioned, and Oslo, they've already implemented congestion pricing uh, and it's working for them. So people who are really concerned, how am I going to get to work? How is this going to happen for me? How am I going to uh, deal with this new system? I would urge them uh, you know, look to the examples of cities who have already uh, implemented this system and the people there are, they're getting by, frankly. And also because this review process is going to take so many years, I will be, I'm a high school student right now, I'll be out of college uh, by the time this, this is actually enacted and put into place. So you have years uh, to figure out how you're going to deal uh, with the, with the new burden. Uh, and also, I'd like to advocate for a moving of the border of the toll zone to 57th Street. I think that is an excellent idea uh, because having, the, having a problem of all of these uh, cars coming in from outside the city and into the Upper East Sides and ep Upper West Sides and pooling as they try to get to the FDR and the Henry Hudson Parkway uh, is going to be a serious problem if we don't allow them uh, a, more, uh, a larger thoroughfare exit. And also I'd like to advocate for an exemption of commercial vehicles uh, because this is about traffic control and uh, promoting new funding for the MTA, not about trying to add a sales tax. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joel Ettinger followed by Howard Yaris. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, my name is Joel Ettinger, and I'm currently an adjunct associate professor at City College, teaching a graduate course on transportation policy. I previously served as the executive director of the New York Metropolitan Transportation Council. I'm a very strong supporter of congestion pricing. However, as a resident of the Upper West Side, I, like many of my neighbors, are concerned about parking in our neighborhoods as congestion pricing is implemented. In October 2019, Manhattan Borough President Brewer's office commissioned an excellent survey of residential parking plans in seven cities worldwide. The borough president's cover letter noted that, quote, many believe a residential parking permit system would eliminate congestion prices, pricing's negative effects on dearly held street parking, end quote. I am one of those believers. I am frankly sick and tired of seeing drivers from neighboring jurisdictions using our streets every day for free parking. 
The borough president survey candidly concluded that the results of residential parking programs have been a mixed bag. Their key to a successful program appears to be setting a high enough price and capping the number of permits issued. As an aside, there would need to be a mechanism set up for subsidies to lower income residents. The key would be to set the right price. The survey concludes with a listing of a number of issues that would need to be thoroughly vetted to decide whether the time is right to implement a residential parking program. The implementation of congestion pricing gives us a once in a lifetime opportunity to see if a residential parking program is right for New York City. Let's finish the project started by the borough president's office. The clock is ticking. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Howard Yaris, followed by Lisa Orman. Hi, uh, my name is Howard Yaris, and I'm co-chair of Manhattan Community Board 7's Transportation Committee. And we, uh, Community Board 7, Manhattan Community Board 7, has adopted a resolution in favor of this. Uh, we strongly feel congestion pricing will is, is an essential change that has to be made to our streets. Um, many people before me have already pointed out how it will, it will um, enable uh, the MTA to provide absolutely necessary upgrades, how it will make our streets much less congested and much less polluted. But I want to point out something else. When I drive my car downtown, there's no charge. The city doesn't charge me at all. It's totally free. When I take um, eco, um, environmentally friendly mass transit, the city charges me 275. Right now, the city has an economic incentive to people to use the least efficient means of transportation. They are providing a, a dollar uh, an incentive, actually a $2.75 uh, dollar incentive to people to use private vehicles as opposed to efficient, safe, and uh, environmentally friendly mass transit. We have to stop this, this incentive. The incentive is the wrong way. Um, we need to encourage people to use mass transit, to not drive around, not drive driving cars causing um, harm to our environment and unsafe street conditions and congestion. So we urge you to adopt congestion pricing for Manhattan as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Lisa Orman, followed by Farley Whitfield. Lisa? Yes, thank you. Um, first of all, here, here to the young people on the call, I would like to say I agree with your sentiments and thank you for testifying. My name is Lisa Orman. I work at Open Plans, a policy and advocacy organization working to make our city more livable. I've worked to make the Upper West Side, my community, a better place for walkers and bikers, and I'm very proud of what we've accomplished. I started this work when my now 18-year-old was born. I couldn't imagine that I would feel comfortable having her bike to school, for instance. And I wanted her to grow up enjoying her community, her streets, her public spaces, and meeting neighbors on the street. Sadly, now when my 16-year-old son tells me that he's biking home from school, I notice my breath get shallow and the sweat beginning to drip. Even with all the work we've done, our streets are still hostile. Like most New Yorkers, we commute with our feet and on the train and occasionally by bike. And let me tell you, when we commute by foot, it's rarely without drama and fear. As New Yorkers, we come to just accept that this is life in the city, but it doesn't need to be. The constant onslaught of noise pollution so loud that you need to scream to have a conversation, the heart jumping terror of crossing at certain intersections, eighth graders afraid to walk to school alone, babies even killed on our sidewalks. Think about how cars and trucks limit our worlds. An urban designer named Donald Appleyard studied the connections people make on their streets. It won't surprise many to hear that more cars and trucks there are on the street, the fewer connections people make. Drivers literally steal our ability to connect with people. So when we charge people to drive through our neighborhoods, it will force them to think twice about doing so. We, the walkers and bikers, get charged just by you being on the streets. 
it's only fair that you should have to pay too. Just because you don't crash doesn't mean you aren't inflicting harm. This is a deeper harm, one that isn't always seen in outward ways, but the damage is there and it's time to fix that. Please implement congestion pricing now with market. no exemptions and consider extending the zone to 96th Street. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Farley Whitfield, followed by Matthias Hess. Farley? You're muted. Farley, if you can unmute yourself, you can begin your uh, There it is. It's more confusing than we think. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Farley Whitfield. I'm a motorcyclist and I live in Hamilton Heights. Motorcycles are one of the best options to reduce congestion in cities because we take a fraction of the space that a car does. We uh, emit a fraction of the sound and pollution. In addition, you can park at least six to eight motorcycles in the space of one car. Motorcycles are highly efficient. We're getting an average of 40 miles per gallon, adding less air pollution compared to cars. As in other cities like London that have introduced congestion pricing, motorcycles have been exempt from paying any fee because they understand that motorcycles are part of the solution to traffic congestion. I'm a stagehand and my work often requires me to travel south of 60th Street at all hours of the day, often at times when the subway is not an option because of infrequent service, like at 4 a.m. when I have to be on set. I urge that motorcycles be exempt from any congestion pricing plans that go into effect in New York City, so please keep motorcycles part of the solution to congestion. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Matthias Hess, followed by Carol Masinolu. Matthias, you may begin your remarks. Hello. We can hear. Matthias. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep. Hi, my name is Matthias Hess. I live in Harlem, and I can't wait for congestion pricing. I don't live in the zone, but I would like it to be expanded to include Upper Manhattan. I'd also like to see the fee based on vehicle size to incentivize drivers to use small vehicles and disincentivize the giant SUVs that are wreaking havoc on our streets. Still, I hope that congestion pricing will reduce driving through my neighborhood because I'm choking on fumes and going deaf from the car horns and the ambulances and fire trucks that are stuck in traffic. Congestion pricing will save lives my main concern is that exceptions will chip away at the program, so I'd ask that you not exempt anyone from congestion pricing. I know everyone wants an exemption, but every person driving creates just as much traffic and congestion as every other person driving. For congestion pricing to work, we need everyone to pay or refrain from driving. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carol Mezanou, followed by Eric Marzal. Hello, my name is uh, Carol Maisonneuve. I live in Harlem and I work in the congestion uh, pricing zone, uh, which is located 80 miles, 80 blocks south of my home. Um, and I go around the city mostly on bike together with my three kids. Um, I, I strongly support congestion pricing and also the extension of the zone actually beyond uh, the current 63 to 96 or even beyond possibly the entire borough. I also support the elimination or the, the reducing uh, of, the, of the exemptions, including uh, the, the exemptions for, uh, for personal vehicles of, of uh, police officers. There are just a few reasons I'll name for um, why I support congestion pricing. First, traffic congestion has been on an exponential 
potential rise in NYC. Uh, the city has already reached or surpassed its pre-pandemic congestion levels. Second, there is a drastic surge in car ownership as a result of the pandemic. Um, this also uh, happened in the absence of clear measures benefiting alternative means of transportation at the start of the pandemic. By contrast, looking at other world capitals like Paris, uh, we've noticed that those uh, if, uh, elected officials in Paris, for instance, have taken um, advantage of the pandemic by making bold statements in support of biking, in support of walking around the city by closing down entire avenues to motor vehicles, not just some select blocks. Third, car rage and road crashes are outrageously reaching unprecedented levels. 60% more pedestrians got killed in NYC this year alone compared to last year. Air pollution is also reaching alarming levels, and climate change is showing its ugly face every day, regrettably providing ample evidence that it's coming much sooner than expected by scientists. And while this planet is 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 our only home, we are still discussing how many exemption categories there should be and when congestion pricing will be established. And if it's established. So let's bear in mind that without a healthy planet to live on, all these discussions will be pointless. I thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Eric Marzal, followed by Peter Chawla. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. My name is Eric Marzal. I'm also a Central Malam resident who works in Midtown, and I strongly support congestion pricing and urge the city and state to implement it as soon as possible. I bike my kids and commute by bike every day, year round. I experience and observe first and on a daily basis the contest issues created by cars for pedestrians, bus riders, or cyclists. Every day without fail, I see crosswalk, bus stop, bus lanes, bike lanes, blocked by cars or trucks. I also see public buses and emergency vehicles stuck in traffic, as well as illegally car cars illegally idling throughout the board. It is really critical that we discourage unnecessary driving, as said by others, and encourage mass transit and other alternatives. We need to do so because we're in a climate crisis, but also because, as explained beautifully by previous speakers, it will make the city quieter, safer, and make it easier for emergency vehicles to move. The previous speaker just highlighted, you know, the heavy cost of traffic, violence, and pollution. 2,000 people died since Mayor de Blasio took office on our streets. Air pollution kills as many as 3,000 people per year, according to our health department. So congestion pricing is the one tool we have to raise the cost of driving while generating revenues to fund alternatives. This is why I strongly support congestion pricing without additional exemptions. If there are too many carve out, too many new carve outs, congestion pricing will fail. Every driver needs to pay for their fair share of their driving. Those who really need to drive will also benefit from reduced congestion. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Peter Chawla, followed by Evelyn David. Hello. Thank you for giving me some time to speak. I really appreciate that uh, you're doing some consultation. I want to start off by just talking about some of the major impacts that cars have on our lives in the city. Like most of Manhattan residents, I live in the, up, uh, I live in the Upper East Side um, in Yorkville. Uh, you know, we don't own cars in my family. We use bikes, we use transit, we, we walk. And, but even though we don't own a car, congestion has major effects on our lives through air pollution um, and through noise pollution and other impacts for um, unsafe streets for when we want to cycle around or when we want to walk around or even when we want to take the bus somewhere. And this is a major problem for the city that's been long overdue to solve. Um, so congestion pricing needs to be implemented as quickly as possible. We've waited years already uh, for the legislature to first pass legislation. Um, and then now, again, many years for the, for the action to be taken on the legislation. And I hope action will be taken as quickly as possible. With uh, There should be zero exemptions. And I would strongly support the others on the call who have um, called for the congestion zone to be extended far north of even of um, 60th Street uh, with no exemptions at all. 
I also want to mention that I um, lived for 10 years in London before I moved to New York City. I was there when congestion pricing was implemented. It was a wonderful improvement on the city. It funded great uh, improvements to transit. It reduced traffic. It reduced pollution. And it made the city much safer for all of its residents. Um, and I also want to support the call for working on a residential parking permit program. That would, that would be an essential, essential way to also discourage driving in the city and discourage car ownership um, because we need to uh, handle some of the, we need to encourage people to not own cars and to not use cars to deal with climate change and um, local air pollution problems. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Evelyn David, followed by Dave Josephson. Yes. Hi. Good evening. This is Evelyn David. I hope you can hear me. Yes. We can hear you. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so the funny thing, the, the last person is talking about London. The residents, this is a little secret and hardly discussed, residents in London living in the zone get a 90% discount. Okay, that's where I'm starting. I, having said that, I am against the plan because it, it's a regressive tax and because it actually does not solve the problem. What does solve the problem is building municipal parking lots near the subway hubs in the outer boroughs, thereby vastly increasing subway rights ridership and decreasing traffic by 50% at least or more because nobody really wants to move drive in here they just do it because it's uh, they can't they can't they can't get to work on time so anyway having said all of this and knowing that you're going to do it anyway that's going to happen having said that i am a long time resident living and parking in this area the problem with the 60th street line is that it cuts off 20 parking spots on the east side of park avenue as drivers can't make the right turn from Lexington Avenue onto 60th Street to park on Park Avenue without entering the zone. If you put the light, so so we're begging you to please put it at least below 60th Street. The other parking, the, the other problem is that the main um, water, sewage, telephone, electrical, and gas lines for the entire area are all located on 60 and 61st Street, and there's constant construction and closures. To cut traffic flooding to the Upper East Side parking garages from the bridge at 6 a.m., put the line below 59, 58, 57 to allow some drivers to go across 59th Street to the West Side garages and return in the p.m. in the afternoon on 58, 57, 57th Street, actually, 58, 59, or 57 to the upper or lower levels. Exemptions. I know everybody's talking about don't do exemptions, but... Adding teachers, teachers who have to come in Please from Connecticut, New Jersey. Pardon me? Please conclude your remarks. Yes. Add teachers to the list as we travel great distances from New Jersey, Connecticut, upstate, and other boroughs, and it's impossible to get transportation to get us there on time. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Sarah Lynn, followed by Chloe Rolden. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Um, I want to start my remarks by stating clearly and unconditionally. When looking at places where congestion pricing has been implemented, there is zero evidence of drivers parking just short of the toll zone before crossing into the zone on foot or by another mode of transportation. As a member of Community Board 7 on the Upper West Side, I've been part of conversations about congestion pricing and its impact on our district for years now. The idea that we will become a giant parking lot for people coming from New Jersey or Westchester has been raised countless times. And it's repeated by some of our elected officials as if it's a fact, but it is not a fact. As noted before, there is zero evidence of this happening in other places that have implemented congestion pricing. The fact is the Upper West Side is already a giant parking lot, one where drivers circle endlessly to try to find a spot. Imagine a driver from New Jersey coming here thinking they're just going to park and hop on the train and then fruitlessly searching and searching and searching for a parking spot. If they do it once, they'll likely never do it again. At that point, drivers will either just pay the congestion fee to park close to wherever they're going, or better, the behavioral incentive will work and they'll take public transit. Ultimately, in fact, the impact on the Upper West Side is likely to be the opposite. Fewer people driving into the congestion zone means fewer people driving through our neighborhoods. The money raised will pay for improvements to our public transportation, which will benefit the 72% of Upper West Siders who don't even own a car. Many of us travel by train or bus or bike into the congestion zone regularly, and being able to move around in a city that isn't clogged by cars is causing crashes and injuries and deaths and exhaust and illness and noise will be so much better for all of us. 
I ask you to implement congestion pricing now with no exemptions. We can't wait any longer. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Craig Later, followed by Matthew DeGillis. Craig? Our next speaker will be Matthew DeGillis, followed by Chris Giordano. Craig? My apologies, my connection died. Good evening, I'm Craig Later, co-chair of both the Transportation Committee and Congestion Pricing Task Force of Community Board 8 on the Upper East Side. In my personal capacity as a resident and transportation planning professional, I look forward to the benefits congestion pricing will produce. Reduce VMT and traffic delays, increase bus speeds, improve air quality and funding inflows to support long overdue transit network upgrades. But speaking in my CBA capacity, my community has a complicated relationship with the tolling plan and is frustrated with the thus far insufficient outreach that has not allowed us the opportunity to directly engage with the decision makers about the unique impacts that the 60th Street cordon line that bisects our district will create. We urge you to follow through on our committee's resolutions in which we have called for two Manhattan members to be appointed to the Traffic Mobility Review Board, one representing communities north of 60th Street, one for those south of 60th Street. We have called for the elimination of the congestion fee for New York City yellow taxis below 96th Street, which unfairly targets our district, and in particular seniors and persons with disabilities that are physically unable to use subways and buses, even for trips entirely within our district. It is critical that any issues be identified and solved by day one of tolling so our district's concerns can be sufficiently addressed. Thus, the transportation planner in me wants to also see the following actions during the planning stages. One, implementation of increased bus and subway service as soon as possible to encourage transit use and mitigate potential overcrowding from those who switch modes once tolling starts. Two, a plan to prevent Queensboro Bridge vehicles from inundating the streets just north of the bridge, such as if inbound traffic gravitates towards the upper level exits outside the toll zone at 61st and 62nd streets, rather than exiting via the lower level at 60th street in the toll zone. And three, a collaborative process to develop appropriate parking policies along blocks just north of the boundary to discourage drivers from parking just short of the toll zone if they are headed towards destinations just south of 60th street, even if such behaviors haven't occurred in other cities. Thank, Thank you, you very much for providing the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Our next speaker is Matthew DeGillis, followed by Chris Giordano. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. All right, my name is Matt Tagolis. I live in Morningside Heights and I'm testifying strongly in favor of congestion pricing with zero exemptions. Is there an exemption for people going to the doctor on the bus? No, there isn't. And there should not be any special exemptions for drivers. Some of the wealthiest people in New York City as shown by data. We have to remember that for every car valve, we have to charge everyone else more as this is mandated to raise $15 billion for the MTA. People keep bringing up equity in their comments against congestion pricing. To that I ask, where is the equity in the South Bronx having some of the highest asthma rates in the country due to cars and trucks driving through? Where is the equity in East Harlem being 30 degrees warmer than the Upper West Side on summer days due to car fumes and congestion? Where is the equity in a three month old dying on the sidewalk in Brooklyn after being run over by a car? Congestion pricing will remove honking, polluting, pedestrian killing vehicles from the streets of New York by eliminating unnecessary trips and encouraging the use of public transit. This legislation, which has already passed, will improve the lives of those who live outside the CBD, along with those living inside the CBD. There's traffic everywhere, after all. Finally, I just wanna mention that I find the environment, environmental review process to be utterly ridiculous. How does this need review? Uh, it will clearly benefit the, the environment. We need to do this now, not in two years. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chris Giordano, followed by Charles 
foreign. Chris? Hi, I'm Chris Giordano. I'm the co-founder and president of the West 64 through 67th Streets Block Association. I'm also the co-founder and president of the Upper West Side Coalition of Block Associations. These remarks are my own. I believe congestion pricing is necessary. And as stated previously, our community board, Community Board 7, has passed a resolution in support of congestion pricing. I believe we need to invest in our public transportation system. We need to incentivize use of the MTA. We need to disincentivize single family cars in these most congested parts of our city. I agree with those who believe we need to expand the congestion pricing zone beyond the current plan. And I believe that there needs to be a Manhattan, that there, there need to be Manhattan community reps um, on this board. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Charles Warren, followed by Hindi Schachter. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'm Charles Warren and I'm also co-chair of the Transportation Committee on Community Board 8, but I'm speaking in my personal capacity. I want to associate myself with the remarks of Craig later and, and my fellow co-chair on the Community Board 7. I strongly support congestion pricing. It's critical that the MTA get increased funding. People seem to forget that when things on the subway were really bad in the early 1980s, an expanded capital program made tremendous improvements and things really got so much better with our subways. We need to do that again and congestion pricing will add to that. I also believe we ought to have very few exemptions. It, low income people are, will be taken care of with the tax credits that's already provided. People with disabilities, if they have disability transportation will also be taken care of. And I wanna say particularly as someone who lives on the Upper East Side, that uh, I do not believe that our district will be inundated with traffic. As a colleague of mine on Community Board 7 said just recently here, uh, people are not going to look around for parking spaces on the Upper East Side or the Upper West Side and then step on public transportation just to avoid a congestion pricing fee. The loss of time and aggravation itself makes sure that they won't do that. Uh, I think we'll also obviously uh, Pricing will contribute to uh, lessening traffic in the city and in, in, the, in the business district. And it'll, it'll have that benefit and also the benefit of in, in increased air quality. So I'm hoping that uh, things will proceed ahead with as few exemptions as possible. And then we can get this program implemented as, as soon as we can. Thanks very much. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Hindi Schachter followed by Jonathan Lindenbaum. Cindy? Yes, I'm here, but I, uh, ah, I see I'm visible, great. I'm Hindi Schachter, I'm a lifelong New York City resident, a pedestrian, a cyclist, a driver, I'm also on the steering committee of Families for Safe Streets, which means that I lost a family member through a crash. I have been advocating street redesign as a way to promote street safety, but street redesign in Manhattan can never take place until we have rational allocation of travel mode choices. Congestion pricing is the first step on the ladder to get a city where people feel safe to walk, to ride bikes, 
and even to drive motorcycles and small cars. I'm going to use my time to say two things. One, I've heard several people tonight say, don't have congestion pricing because it hurts seniors. I am a senior and have been one for quite a while. We seniors are pedestrians, we are cyclists. More than anyone else, we need safe streets. Don't exempt seniors, seniors benefit. Second, do this quickly. Don't wait years, don't wait for more deaths from traffic fatalities. Do it now. Say after me, no more widows, no more parents mourning children killed in crashes. Congestion your remarks. the first step. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Jonathan Lindenbaum, followed by Russell Squire. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I'd just like to briefly address the arguments against toll pricing that we've heard tonight for the benefit of the board and for all undecided New Yorkers who happen to be watching. Uh, and also a shout out to motorcyclists for being really organized around this. Uh, honestly, you guys deserve a carve out just for that. It's really impressive. Anyway, I noticed a lot of previous speakers talked about how we're taxed enough, but the simple fact is that the vast majority of taxpayers, to be specific, 96% of all workers in the city will not be paying this toll. That's how few people drive into the congestion area for a commute. So to pay congestion pricing as this like giant family destroying tide that's going to sweep the city is a little bit silly. Fully 55% of driving commuters to the central business district are considered high income. Only 16% have incomes low enough to be even twice the poverty line. So let's not pretend this is going to drive people out of the city, no pun intended. Some speakers also pointed out that a lot of people have no choice but to drive into the CBD. First, I should point out that except for the Staten Island Railroad and Jersey Light Rail, every mass transit system, every commuter rail system terminates or passes through the CBD. And even in transit poor neighborhoods, no more than 9% of commuters in the most affected areas commute into the CBD by car. Second, the fact remains that even if you aren't driving here by choice, you're still driving here. Does the kid with asthma care what motivation the traffic has? No, there's still traffic, which means poor air quality and constant danger to literally millions of pedestrians. You cause an externality, so you should price it. Third, if you really need to drive into the CBD, you should be happy that this toll exists, because thousands of drivers who don't need to drive will be more likely to leave the car at home. That means less traffic for you, turning the toll you're paying into effectively a fast pass, one that helps the environment while also speeding your commute. To sum up, I urge the board to reject these sort of arguments against congestion pricing and implement it with as few carve-outs as possible. I urge you not to let this key transport fix suffer a death by a thousand cuts. I urge you to take this step towards a better lower Manhattan, a more livable city, and a greener future. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Russell Squire, followed by Gordon Novode. Hi, I'm Russell Squire. I'm the chair of Community Board 8 Manhattan. First, I just want to say it's been great to hear from so many of my fellow board members and residents of our community district, which covers the Upper East Side and Roosevelt Island. I'm submitting this comment on behalf of Community Board 8, which encompasses both sides of the border of the congestion pricing zone, which is why I spoke in the previous meeting focusing on Manhattan below 60th Street. Most of Manhattan Community District 8 is above 60th Street, which is why I'm speaking again tonight. I strongly urge that the Traffic Mobility Review Board include and be required to include two members from Manhattan, one from below 60th Street and one from above 60th Street. I want to thank Assembly Member Rosenthal and Senator Jackson for speaking on behalf of Manhattan representation on the review board. I want particularly to thank the representative of Assemblymember Seawright who mentioned the board resolution on this. Currently, there are requirements that representatives of MTA regions outside of New York City be represented on the Traffic Mobility Review Board. However, the biggest impacts of congestion pricing will be felt in Manhattan. The MTA has rightly recognized that uh, because they have noted that the impact is going to be different within the zone uh, compared to outside the zone. And that's why you've rightly held two things focused on Manhattan, one that was focused on the impact within the zone and one that was focused on the impact outside of the zone. 
the interest in both of area Manhattan should be represented when decisions about the implementation of congestion pricing are made. For these reasons, it is essential that the Traffic Mobility Review Board include and be required to include two members from Manhattan, one from below 60th Street and one from above 60th Street. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Gordon Novode, followed by Louis Bernier Hero. Gordon. Hi, good, good afternoon, or good evening, I should say, and thank you for the accommodation. I apologize to everybody listening so intently. Um, I wanted to rise, uh, one, I'm an Upper East Sider. I live outside the zone, but I live close enough to the zone where um, I can see from my apartment where the exit is to the FDR on the Upper East Side. And I have major concerns about this from a traffic flow, congestion, pollution standpoint. We may be relieving some congestion uh, south of the border, uh, but respectfully, and I heard the comments that others have made this evening, um, I happen to think that we'll see, you know, vast sums of cars uh, that ordinarily would exit the FDR at a lower point, exit at 63rd Street. And perhaps people aren't going to drive around the neighborhood uh, looking for a spot, but perhaps people are going to drive to a garage in my neighborhood to park their cars. And as a non-car owner myself, I'm not really concerned about garage pricing uh, or private garage pricing. I'm really concerned about the traffic that will bring to the neighborhood as additional folks who normally wouldn't commute to the area get off the highway to go to their new garages. And by the way, that says nothing for those who are working at Memorial Sloan Kettering or Hospital for Special Surgery or Wow Cornell who frequently park in my neighborhood anyway because they are attracted to those hospitals. Um, that being said, um, you know, there are consequences here. Um, Manhattan is not the healthiest city at this point. Uh, and I'm speaking really from an economic standpoint. Uh, we're on the cusp of a rebound from the pandemic. And um, the second that we start to implement taxing and other policies, which could harm our business community, is the second that we as New Yorkers will all regret that. Um, you know, frankly, downtown uh, ser serves all of us. Uh, I don't live in the congestion district, but we all benefit from a healthy New York economy. Um, the MTA needs work. There's no doubt about it that money needs to be spent and it needs to be spent on and actually go to effective upgrades and improvements. But there's no reason to believe that congestion pricing. Include your remarks. Here. So I appreciate everybody's time. I should have said at the beginning, I oppose congestion pricing. I think it's a big mistake. And I don't think we as New York. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Louis Bernier Hero, followed by Kate Rockwell. Hello, everyone. My name is Louis Bernier Hero, and I'm a resident of Washington Heights for the past six years. I'm also a member of Family for Safe Street. This organization gathers in individuals who have been personally injured who or have lost a loved one uh, during a car crash. And together we fight to prevent this from happening to anyone else. On December 30th, 2020, my mother-in-law, Eva Barza, was killed by a driver in his pickup truck while she was walking near her house. She lost her life because our leaders put the convenience of driving before the safety of the people. We all deserve to live in a more civilized world. The congestion pricing system we are, that we are discussing tonight is not only a tool to improve traffic conditions, the quality of air, and raise money for public transportation. It's also a tremendous instrument to improve road safety, as it has been shown in multiple cities. But as a resident of the city living outside of the congestion zone, I wanted to know how it will impact the safety on my streets in my neighborhood. Well, a study from the Lancaster University in the UK has shown that the safety benefits of the congestion zone in London were not limited to the charge zone itself, but also to its periphery. After 10 years, not, not only were crashes and fatalities reduced in the area surrounding the congestion zone, but they were reduced at an even greater rate than, than, than the 20 other largest cities in the UK. All New Yorkers will benefit from the, the congestion pricing, 
will, it should have been implemented a long time ago and there's no more time to lose. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Kate Rockwell, followed by Ken Coughlin. Kate? Yep. Please be in your remarks. My name is Kate Brockwell. I'm a member of Families for Safe Streets, and I live on the Upper West Side. There are many reasons to implement congestion pricing as soon as possible, but I want to focus on safety and the urgency of safer streets. Fewer car trips will mean fewer crashes. Every single day before congestion pricing is implemented is another day when New Yorkers will be injured and killed going to work, to school, for a walk, to visit a friend, or to run an errand. We should find that intolerable. In New York, congestion pricing is predicted to result in a 15% reduction in crashes for 71 fewer fatalities and 17,000 fewer injuries per year. In central London, congestion pricing has led to a 40% reduction in crashes. The MTA has a chance to take transformative action here. We can't afford a two-year process or more exceptions. Every New Yorker is at times a pedestrian. It's our most vulnerable road users who are most likely to be injured and killed. Kids, older folks, people with disabilities, people who work on New York City streets, return home from long shifts at all hours and, all, and in all weather. I was hit by a pedestrian in December 2017 while running errands for family. I was walking in the crosswalk, had the light, the driver had been waiting to make a left turn, failed to yield and drove into me, causing serious knee, leg and wrist injuries and PTSD. I was 32 and a student and expect to be dealing with the event forever. The driver who hit me was on a trip of convenience and most of his route, including driving into me, was in what will be the central business district. People less close to the fight against traffic violence tend to believe that you have to do something wrong to be hit by a car. But I'm not a special case. Families for State Streets is full of other people like me who are not on their phones and weren't jaywalking. We just dared to go outside. The problem is our streets, traffic infrastructure, and car culture. Please conclude your remarks. The randomness and frequency of traffic violence are terrifying and unacceptable, and congestion pricing will encourage drivers to reconsider non-essential trips and make streets safer for all users. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next speaker will be Ken Coughlin, followed by Jordan Stein. Thanks. My name is Ken Coughlin. I'm a member of Community Board 7 Manhattan, but I'm speaking here solely in my personal capacity. One of the great paradoxes of living in New York City is that while it's entirely possible for the majority to have a full life without a car, the city's worst aspect is its traffic. Just think of the toll that cars and trucks exact on us. Hundreds killed and tens of thousands injured each year thousands more suffering early deaths from tailpipe emissions, city life degraded by traffic noise, and the theft of untold space to accommodate cars. Gas taxes don't come close to covering these enormous costs. This is not acceptable and it's not sustainable. The congestion charge could be thought of as a modest impact charge. And the beauty of this charge is that it will pour billions into making public transit an even more attractive alternative to driving. The fierce opposition from car owners shows how effective the charge will be. And to those who think that north of 60th will turn into a parking lot, if anyone seriously thinks that drivers are going to spend 45 minutes hunting for virtually non-existent parking or park all day in a garage just to avoid paying the congestion charge, there's a still free bridge downtown you may be interested in buying. Congestion pricing must be rolled out with no exemptions and as quickly as possible. Our streets are in crisis. Fewer cars means fewer collisions and fewer deaths. It's as simple as that. We don't need to study the obvious for 16 months. Our city and our planet cannot wait for the optimal political moment. Let's do this now at long last. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jordan Stein, followed by Yvonne Condi. As a reminder, if you've joined the Zoom under a name that is different from the one you used when you signed up to speak, please identify yourself in the Q&A function with the name you used when you signed up. 
Our next speaker is Jordan Stein. Hello, sorry for the background, I'm still at work. Um, my name is Jordan Stein and I'm speaking on behalf of the Four Freedoms Democratic Club. As the largest democratic club in Yorkville, we represent hundreds of people, um, paying members, and we want to speak with one clear voice to say that we support congestion pricing. We want it implemented as soon as humanly possible and that there should be no exceptions. We represent a large spectrum of views on almost every issue, but we were able to pass a resolution saying this unanimously in our club um, because the need is so strong and the benefits are so clear. Uh, we will all reap the benefits of cleaner air, quicker commutes, and faster emergency response times. We encourage the MTA to accelerate the environmental review and start implementation of congestion pricing as soon as possible. Thank you so much for your time. I will yield the remainder of my time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Yvonne Pande, followed by Richard Robbins. Yvonne? Hello, Yvonne Conde here. We can hear Hi. you. you okay, thank you. Good evening. As seniors, both my husband and I label congestion pricing as an anti-senior measure. We're lifelong New Yorkers, yet we have not used the subway since March 2019 due to safety concerns, valid safety concerns, and COVID contagion concerns. Remember that the city urged us not to use public transportation during the lockdown. Seniors are targets for thugs. We're too old for motorcycles and we're too old for bicycles. We use our car very sparingly. We drive each other to doctor's appointments. We drive to Queens to save money on groceries. In order to do this, we have to enter the 59th Street Bridge this is the zone for one block, although we would not contribute to any congestion. We live on East 63rd Street, the last exit on the East Side Drive before the zone, and also the street where the 59th Street exits. I cannot even contemplate what will happen to traffic on this street and on our neighborhood. Mr. Warren of Community Board 8 hasn't considered this or he doesn't care. Please consider the congestion and overburden East 63rd Street on seniors and overtaxed New York residents when you implement charges and consider appropriate adjustments. Thank you very much on behalf of all seniors of New York City. Thank you. Our next speaker is Richard Robbins, followed by Sproul Love. Richard? Yeah, um, it took a while to get set up, but here I am. I'm Richard Robbins. I'm a member of Manhattan Community Board 7, which represents the Upper West Side, but I'm speaking in my personal capacity. Congestion pricing is a no-brainer. We know it works in other cities. We need it in New York City. The only way that anyone is able to drive into Manhattan is if others are taking public transportation. If everyone going into Manhattan drove in a car, we'd have complete gridlock. Charging those people who do drive into the central business district and using that money for tra public transportation helps those who drive by keeping public transportation viable and the streets flowing. It also helps the environment. Gas taxes don't come close to covering the cost of building and maintaining roads. All taxpayers, including non-drivers, are subsidizing the cost of drivers. We need to make sure there are no carve-outs to this policy, especially as any carve-outs are sure to be abused, as we see with parking placards. This would shift costs to those who play by the rules, and as carve-outs will inevitably go to those who are most politically powerful. We also need to be careful of the impacts of those of us who live north of the wall, such as in the Upper West Side. I personally would love to see congestion pricing uh, to be the entire borough of Manhattan. Uh, in response to congestion pricing, I proposed a resolution to Manhattan Community Board 7 saying that we need resident parking to ensure that our neighborhood doesn't become a parking lot for people driving into the city who want to avoid paying the toll. 
and an asthma zone uh, due to the increased congestion and pollution in our neighborhood. This morphed into a resolution passed by Community Board 7 by a nearly two to one margin that requests that DOT assess current policy regarding parking and curbside usage, including but not limited to paid residential parking permits, and to conduct studies both before and after the implementation of congestion pricing to establish its effect on the community. It's essential that the impacts of our neighborhood be uh, considered immediately and that congestion pricing is implemented as soon as possible and that we have representatives both from, from Manhattan, both inside and outside of the zone on the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Sproul Love, followed by Toby Lerner. Evening, thanks for the opportunity to speak on this topic. Uh, I live uh, on 124th Street in Harlem between Lennox and Adam Clayton Powell. I'm a father of two school-aged children. We ride uh, often in the neighborhood and downtown, bikes that is, and I commute by bike to work. Uh, I, I really, I am strongly in favor of congestion pricing. I think the, uh, Cordon should be much higher, be great if it was up here in Harlem. I want to make two points. Uh, I agree with everything that's been said of, in favor of congestion pricing, but the first point is for those who are not willing to look abroad for examples where congestion pricing was very successful, uh, I want to remind folks that, you know, when before we kicked cars out of Central Park, everyone predicted a traffic apocalypse, um, businesses that wouldn't be able to get customers and a city choked with traffic that didn't happen. And now Central Park is a car-free oasis. Um, I wanna make another point that hasn't been mentioned. Uh, I, I think one of the most important things about the proposed congestion pricing plan is the rationalization of East River tolls. Um, you know, it's something we haven't been able to do in a century. And that alone is going to um, reduce traffic in Manhattan. You know, you, you now have commercial trucks that take the Gowan take go from New Jersey to the Gowanus to enter over the East River, which which is ridiculous. So, uh, I think the the congestion pricing area should be larger. I think we should do it more quickly. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Toby Lerner, followed by Quentin. Kyle Brunner. Toby? Toby, oh, I think we can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one of the speakers just before touched on what I'm going to say. The congestion pricing, as I am under the impression, it's supposed to be for to prevent or to discourage people from going into the business district. The business district to me is below 57th Street. And to go to the Queensboro Bridge, like she mentioned, if I'm going from the upper numbers to the Queensboro Bridge, I have to pay because it's on 59 and a half street, not, and that's below 60th street. By the same token, if you live in Queens and you work at Columbia or somewhere uptown, you have to pay because you're coming in below 60th street. I believe what one of the, uh, Steve Chazen and a few other people said, congestion pricing could work, but you have to go to 57th Street because to go a half a block and pay is not. It's like a money grab. Told the bridge if you want people to pay on the bridge. But to make you pay for a half a block when you're not going downtown, you have no intention of going downtown. And you're going to work either in Queens or you're going to work in upper Manhattan. Why should you pay? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Clinton Heilbernier, followed by Mikhail Ribnicki. Hey everyone, am I going through? 
Yes, we can. All right, I love it. Um, thank you so much. Um, my name is Quentin Hallenbronner. Um, I'm a fourth generation New Yorker, a fourth generation Manhattanite, but that doesn't matter. We're a city of immigrants and it shouldn't matter whether someone's family's been here since the 1800s or whether somebody just moved to town. That's just a thing that always sticks in my head. But anyway, um, I want to talk about the specifically the challenge of, you know, what will lower income folks do about congestion pricing? And I just want to bring a couple of stats and facts into the conversation. Um, so in Manhattan, over 75% of households don't own a car. And of those who do, um, the median household income is $134,000 a year. That's for families in Manhattan with vehicles. For families in Manhattan that don't have vehicles, their median household income is under 70,000. Um, there's this sort of myth that people are, that this is a regressive tax. And the truth is the exact opposite. People who are getting paid more and more are more likely to own cars, more likely to drive them and use them in the city. Um, another detail on small business owners, my partner's dad is actually a plumber. Uh, he works, uh, he doesn't work in New York City, but if he did, congestion pricing would actually help his business. For just $20, $30 a day, he would spend less time stuck in traffic in lower Manhattan and more time actually servicing customers and making money. Want to have one last detail. I'm wearing this business because I'm an open streets worker. And I have seen the incredible benefits of the open streets programs for small businesses, really of all ranges. And while obviously these are both different programs, there's a similarity in terms of fewer cars means a more vibrant city and fewer cars means more money for small business, more money for regular people and more money for transit, which is what the vast, vast majority of New Yorkers and especially of Manhattanites use to go to work, to go to school and to live their lives. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mikhail Ribnicki, followed by Christine Negra. And I'd like to let everyone know that due to the large number of speakers, we will be going over our scheduled time, but everyone who signed up will be called to speak today. If you do not want to wait to be called, you may send us comments directly. For more details, please visit our website, new.mta.info forward slash project forward slash CBDTP, or post them in the Q&A function on Zoom. Our next speaker is Mikhail Ribnicki. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I just, uh, my name is Michael Ribnicki. I live on the Upper East Side, and I am totally against congestion pricing. The idea of forcing drivers to pay for an agency, the MTA, and I'm, by the way, I'm over 70 years of age, which is, and I've been in New York all my life. Um, the idea of forcing drivers to pay for an agency which has been unable to balance its budget in my entire lifetime due to its inefficiency, its corrupt contracts where you pay $100 for a, 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 a track tie, and it's a union which is totally unable to control every time they hold their breath, uh, you have to give them an increase in pay, is outrageous. Um, Rudolph Giuliani, during the transit strike of the early 90s, implemented that cars coming into Manhattan from 6 to 10 p.m. or leaving Manhattan from 4 to 7 p.m. have to have four people in the car. This is a much more efficient way of controlling traffic than, than charging a fee for cars. Because now the rich people are going to just pay anyway. They couldn't care less. A lot of them, you know, their companies pay for their cars anyway, so they're not going to pay a fee. And it's only, the only people that's going to hurt are people like myself who are limited income people and just struggling to survive in Manhattan. And um, I think uh, there's other ways that, that this can be done. And uh, thank you very much for, for letting me speak. Have a good evening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christine Negra, followed by Woody Halvey. Christine? Yes, hi. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much to the organizers of the forum. My name is Christine Negra. Um, I'm an environmental scientist, and I'm joining this meeting to advocate for the exemption of motorcycles from congestion tolls. 
I live in Manhattan. The only motorcycle motor vehicle that I own is a 500 cc motorcycle. It's small. It's quiet. It makes it easy for me not to own a car uh, and still get to places that I need to go that are not well served by public transit. Um, I always wear a helmet. I operate my motorcycle legally. I never mix riding with drugs or alcohol. I'm involved in safety training as part of a women's motorcycle club. Many, many members of my club who live in Manhattan and larger parts of the New York City area rely on their motorcycles to get to work and to do their work. Um, the club has been recognized for its volunteer service, including delivering food and PPE by motorcycle during the early months of the pandemic. When I visited Berlin, Athens, Hanoi, um, I've seen that these are cities where smoothly flowing urban roadways are possible when instead of cars, the primary mode of transportation for people are two-wheeled vehicles. Um, other future-ready cities have already provided dedicated motorcycle parking and used other measures that are designed to take advantage of the reality that motorcycles are have a small parking footprint, they're fuel efficient, and they have a much lower burden on road surfaces than do cars and trucks. Um, I would love to see New York City recognize motorcycles as part of the solution to congestion and exempting motorcycles from congestion tolls is a critical first step. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Woody Halvey, followed by Mark Friedman. Woody? Woody, if you can unmute yourself, you can begin your remarks. Unmute. Hey. Hi, everybody. Uh, congestion, congestion price. It's hard for me even to say. It's made of two words, congestion and price. The truth is, that it's about price, come on, it's not about congestion. We want more money, yeah, more money for the city. A side effect may be congestion, but it, it's clearly a bad excuse just to get more money. Everybody knows that and allow me to say it out loud. If you really want less congestion, reopen the lanes that the Blasio closed. My street has three lanes, now it has, had three lanes, now it has one. But this train has left long ago. The congestion fine uh, will be applied. And if uh, we want, uh, if we need to take that pill, let's try to sugarcoat it. So what can we do? Let's learn from London. Allow motorcycles and scooters to get in without paying. It is not an exemption for low income or for essential workers. It just serves the purpose. How? A motorcycle is about 27 to 35 times less damaging the roads. So you get less repairs, you get real money saving here. In addition, you get to park uh, seven motorcycles in the spot of one car. And that will cause a domino effect where cars are no longer looping in the street for searching for parking. Did you ever spend long minutes uh, looking for parking? Well, I didn't because I use a scooter or a motorcycle sometimes. Allow me to say I feel very smart when I park without spending any time like most of the cars do. We, motorcyclists, pollute much less. My bike is 78 miles on a gallon. Uh, that alone should exempt us from toll and should be, we should be rewarded for using a, a vehicle that is causing less congestion, combined with very little pollution, less time on the road, less damage, and you have a real improvement of life quality and real money saving. If you are going to tax me to go shopping downtown, as I always do, I'm going to Amazon. I'm not going to pay this tax. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Mark Friedman, followed by Jeff Bloom. Mark? I'm here. We can um, hear you. You can't hear me? We can hear you. Oh, good. Well, uh, this uh, tolling program is really corrosive to New York City values. I'm going to give you about five or six examples of that. You can sleep on it, but I can give you 10 more if you had time. 
Uh, the first is that the idea is that it's going to reduce congestion in the central business district. But to say that more honestly, it will reduce the congestion from people who can't pay $24, $23 to go. So it won't reduce the congestion. It'll allow what a previous caller called a fast pass for people with money to drive into Midtown and eliminate the people who are not on this call. Let's go to some other things it does. It monetizes public space that belongs to all these people. Now we have a new gated community. Now we have a community that paid the money to get there or paid the money for an apartment there, but they're protected in the gated community. I think that's against New York City values. I think it spoils common spaces that we're all entitled to. I hear, I hear from Community Board 7, where I live, who does not represent me, who have been infiltrated by transportation alternatives, that they have a resolution. Every time they have a resolution, this neighborhood comes up in arms. They have been co-opted. I hear from a whole bunch of, of bicyclists who have the same talking points. Has anybody noticed that they say the exact same thing? Please My grandmother your came remarks. here and was so happy to be away from a country where she was taxed or shaken down to go somewhere. Thank you. And we're doing that here. Our next speaker is Jeff Blum, followed by Anchor Dalal. Hello? We can hear you. Hi, uh, I'm an Upper West Side senior. I moved to New York four years ago, in part because it would be a walkable, transit-friendly city in which to grow old. We need congestion pricing for three reasons to make the transit system better, to protect the environment, and to create incentives to reduce car traffic so that people like my young granddaughter and myself can safely walk. Representative Espaillat has more rider constituents than any other member of the U.S. House. Northern Manhattan is also an environmental justice community, which has long suffered significant air pollution problems from diesel exhaust and cut through traffic. My transit riding neighbors in Harlem and Washington Heights earn below the medium income in their communities. Better transit is a matter of basic equity. The subway needs fixing. On most days, signal problems still delay trains. And it's still overwhelmingly inaccessible, shamefully excluding half a million New Yorkers who can't climb stairs. I can imagine when I'll be one of those New Yorkers. We need every subway station to be accessible. The MTA already has a plan to fix the subway with the billions from congestion pricing without new exemptions. No other source of funds exists to do that. The pandemic gave us a tantalizing glimpse of communities that work for residents and less for cut through driving. Better transit is crucial to continue the open streets we've begun to experience. We need more bus lanes and modernized bus routes. We need to re reduce ride hail vehicles in the Manhattan core with something like the council speaker's proposed fee on time without passengers. While this public process goes on, I hope the MTA will take immediate action to show New Yorkers previews of the better service we're buying with congestion pricing. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kevin Fagan, followed by Cecilia Ellis. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect, thanks. Um, appreciate the time and the outreach here. Um, I guess I just have very limited remarks. I live in the Upper West Side, just north of the congestion area. Um, just wanna express strong support for congestion pricing with basically no carve outs. Um, I also don't think that there's gonna be a massive parking issue in the Upper West Side. The parking situation here is already a disaster and can take hours to find spots anyway. Um, so I really don't think that's a, a serious issue. 
Um, we're in a climate emergency, and I really don't think this is the time to consider adding more vehicles into the central business district. The MTA tolls already show that there's more traffic now than there was in 2019. We need to get people back on the trains, back on the buses, back on the subways, um, and I'll just yield the rest of my time since we're already run over. Thanks. Thank you. The next speaker is Cecilia Ellis, followed by Robert Green. Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Cecilia Ellis, and I am the field manager for the NYPIRG Strap Hangers Campaign. Since 1979, the Strap Hangers Campaign has advocated on behalf of public transit riders in New York City for affordable fares, more attractive service, and the continued rebuilding and expansion of city transit. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, we urge a thorough, swift, and just environmental review and implementation of congestion pricing without delay. Proper investment in public transportation will help fix historic inequities, deliver racial justice, and combat climate change. These funds are an opportunity for that. We hear from college students every day, loud and clear, that they want and need better public transportation. When asked why, they share things like, I'm sick of being late to class, or I need better transit because Uber is too expensive. Tristan Gardner, a student at Queens College, shared that for her, it's often a question of, do I stand here and wait or start walking when dealing with buses in Queens? Jeremiah Clemente, a City Tech alum, says he's sick of feeling like he's relying on sheer luck to get to his destination on time. Menaka Muller, a student at Brooklyn College, said, emphasizes that students are already paying for tuition, expensive textbooks, and transit. They need affordable and fully functioning transportation. New York City's buses crawl through their routes at an average speed of merely seven miles per hour. Buses sit in, in streets clogged with cars and are impeded from accessing their stops by illegally parked cars. Subway riders seek thousands of canceled trips per month and the system is by far the least accessible of any major American city. As you know, pre-pandemic, fewer than 4% of all New Yorkers living in outer boroughs drove into Manhattan CBD for work compared to the 56% who rely on public transportation. Public transportation, as mentioned, is an extension of the city's higher education system. Students, especially CUNY students, do not live on campus and depend on transit. So to conclude, congestion pricing would provide new, stable funding for transit, funding needed to aid in repairing and modernizing New York City's ailing subway and bus service, and ensure the pandemic recovery for New York Let's City as a whole. Remarks. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Robert Green, followed by Anita. Ruben. Hi, I've been hearing a lot of nonsense and whining the past couple of weeks in these hearings. So let's set some things straight. I hear about parking Armageddon coming. There is no evidence this has ever happened anywhere congestion pricing has been implemented. I hear this is a regressive tax. No, it isn't. The average driver is richer and whiter than the average New Yorker. Hey, I'm an average Jersey guy who drives into Manhattan every day. No, you aren't. 1.6% of Jersey commuters come in by car. I come to the hospitals every day and they are all in the district. No, they aren't. There are only two of our 10 major hospitals in the district. I'm a disability advocate. What about us? The money raised would create more accessible subways and buses, helping people like my elderly parents get into and out of public transportation. So yes, you have been considered. Bikes are bad. I almost got hit by one the other day. Sorry, how is that relevant? Anyway, there have been over 2,000 people killed by cars in New York in the past 10 years and less than 10 killed by bikes. So no, come on, try harder. I'm looking out for poor people. I'm an elected. Are you or are you just continuing to protect your parking privilege, your placards, and the city fleet of SUVs that plague and choke our streets? Look, I could discourse at length about how living in a society requires shared sacrifice and each of us trying to account for our own costs we impose upon others. But instead, I can sum it up by quoting the great, great Twitter poet, Bread Fixer, who tweeted, my opinion, congestion pricing should be applied exclusively to people who aren't me. The real problem on the streets is people who aren't me doing things that don't benefit me. Past congestion pricing with no exemptions, and as an aside for you motorcyclists, if you can't muffle your engines, you should pay triple for your oral torture assault you inflict on the rest of us. Thank you. Thank you. As a reminder, due to the large number of speakers tonight, we are over our scheduled time, but everyone who signed up will be called to speak tonight. Our next speaker 
will be Anita Rubin, followed by Michael Murray. Hello. Um, I think I'm in the minority because I actually live in Midtown Manhattan on 55th Street between 5th and 6th Avenues. I garage my car at an expensive fee uh, on the same block. I used to walk to work and that was wonderful, but now that I'm retired, um, I'm no longer working and I cannot walk distances and the subways are definitely out because of the steps. For those of you who promote no exemptions, I suggest you are not on a fixed income and a middle-class person uh, like I am. Uh, as a senior citizen and having lived in Midtown Manhattan for more than 45 years, most of my adult life, I find it egregious that I'm going to be taxed for the privilege of living here. 14 to $35 as a fee for me to be able to use my own car when I come home is not something that I feel is fair to anyone. In short, residents who are, should be exempt from fees, and I feel I'm being punished for living in Midtown Manhattan, my home for most of my adult life, as I've said. And although I appreciate the bicycles, there's no enforcement of bicycles uh, traveling against the traffic, traveling on the sidewalks. Yes, they may not be causing uh, deaths, but they certainly cause injuries. And I'm afraid to cross the street without looking both ways because every day another bicycle is coming down the wrong way or riding on the sidewalk. Thank you for conducting such a organized uh, discussion of this problem. And as I said, it should be considered uh, not to go forward and give residents a permanent exemption. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Michael Murray, followed by Colette Vogel. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my name is Michael Murray. I'm a senior citizen on a fixed income in one of the most expensive locations on the planet. Uh, I suffer from severe COPD and emphysema, which make it impossible for me to take public transportation. And yet I live inside the zone. The car is in my wife's name. She's the driver in the family. I don't drive. Every time I go to Mount Sinai to see a pulmonologist or I go to <clears throat> New York Presbyterian to see the lung transplant doctors, I will be charged a horribly regressive tax. There need to be exemptions for seniors and people with disabilities who live inside the zone. And frankly, the $60,000 a year cutoff point for an exemption for to anybody who lives in Manhattan, you know that's nowhere near enough. The, and it is unfortunately true that just about everybody who's been on this call is focused on people who drive into the central business section. It's a completely other thing when you look at it through the lens of someone who lives in the district and would be harassed, indeed raped, every time they use their vehicle. I am aghast at all of the young, healthy cyclists who live outside the district who get on this call with no regard, no recollection, no compassion for those who would suffer if this proposal goes through as it is. It is complete and inhumane. These people need to think about others besides themselves. Time and time again, they ignore everybody who isn't as healthy as they are. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Sasha Rose Phillips, followed by C.N.
Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sasha Rose Phillips, and I'm an associate at the Environmental Defense Fund. EDF strongly supports the Central Business District tolling program, and we have long championed congestion pricing as an innovative and highly effective solution to reducing traffic and raising the funding needed to reinvest in our public transit infrastructure. We commend New York City's political leaders for being the first in the nation to adopt this policy, which has already inspired a dozen other US cities to start exploring congestion pricing programs of their own. However, it is critical, it is essential that New York gets it right. Every month we delay is a month that sees the continued trajectory of worsening traffic, rising smog levels, and the failure to deliver safe, reliable, and accessible public transit services. Furthermore, if New York is to succeed in achieving its climate goals, it must aggressively pursue a slate of complementary progressive policies aimed at greening the transportation sector. The Central Business District Tolling Program is a critical and foundational part of that effort. The deployment of funds generated by this initiative will enable 12 million New York metro area residents to enjoy the benefits of less traffic, better transit, and cleaner air. And no group will likely benefit more than New York's marginalized communities. We urge the MTA and its partners to adopt an effective and equitable tolling plan, together with the appropriate objectives and metrics in place to ensure the program's long-term success and positive impact, particularly for marginalized communities. In cities like Singapore, London, Milan, and Stockholm, congestion pricing has transformed the transportation experience and quality of life for their citizens. The faster we get congestion pricing up and running is the sooner this vision will become a reality for everyday New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be C. Penn, followed by Lauren Secular. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, sorry about that. I apologize. Hi, I am a disabled person and I'm also low income and I am for the congestion charge. I live here in uh, Midtown Manhattan. I don't believe the congestion charge will affect people like me who are disabled and who are low income. The disabled have access a ride. They have e-health on demand program. They have fair fares program. Uh, you know, so they don't need to uh, worry about the congestion charge. And hospitals, hospitals such as the New York Eye and Infirmary, for example, they allow patients to have discounted um, fees if they are driving into the city and using parking garages. So they have agreements with some parking garages, and I, I think other hospitals do the same thing. Also, health plans like Medicaid actually provide free transportation to medical appointments. So if you're someone like me on Medicaid, I can get a free uh, ride to my appointment with Uber or Lyft or even an ambulance. So I don't believe all this uh, talk about the poor and disabled being affected, and especially coming from mostly middle-class people who have no idea what it's like to be poor or disabled, no disrespect. And uh, I do believe that uh, New York City has been a major city, has a high amount of dry eye sufferers. So if congestion charge did come in, um, dry eye sufferers will be, uh, you know, having better symptoms. Also, please make sure taxi drivers don't pass on the uh, congestion charge fee onto their passengers. I think that's a very important note to make. And I just think you'll free up the city from cars that, block the crosswalk where pedestrians have to weave in and out of big uh, trucks and cars who are just standing there in the crosswalk when they shouldn't be there. Um, you know, so um, I think it's very important to implement this congestion charge. It's, it's good for the city. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Lauren Secular, followed by Christopher Reif. Lauren? Good evening. My name is Lauren Secular with the American Motorcycle Association, District 34. 
I'm a resident of Manhattan, and I've been an avid motorcyclist for nearly 40 years. The stated goal of congestion pricing, also known as Central Business Tolling Program, is to lower traffic and help MTA improve its transit system by tolling vehicles that enter or remain in Manhattan's central business. In fact, Grant, sorry. In central business by tolling all vehicles. The proposed program, however, does not take into account the fact that granting fuel efficient, congestion reducing vehicles, such as motorcycles and scooters, anything less than 100% exemption would run counter to the MTA stated objective for this project. Motorcycles are incrementally better than cars we are trying to restrict with a high toll. They take up far less space than regular cars parking, especially the SUVs that dominate our roads and cause disproportionate amounts of carnage. Let's keep motorcycles part of the solution. The wheelbase of a Chevy Suburban is almost 11 feet, while the motorcycle base of a motorcycle is less than five feet. Plus it's legal in New York for two motorcycles to travel side by side the same lane. That's at least four or more vehicles in the space of one SUV, or eight if each motorcycle has a passenger. In other words, many more people than an SUV, which often has much one person in it. Internationally, Evans from municipalities with congestion pricing suggests that differentiating tolls by size and vehicle can reduce congestion. London and Stockholm, for example, both exempt motorcycles from tolls to encourage switching from automobiles to motorcycles. In order to reach the stated goal, the MTA ought to do everything possible to encourage the use of motorcycles and other two-wheel vehicles with full exemption. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Christopher Greif, followed by Deborah Greif. Christopher? I'm here, but I'm having a little camera issue. Here we go. Can you see me now? Good. Good evening, everyone. I'm Christopher Deep Wright. And yes, I'm also an advocate for Brooklyn, but also accessibility advocate for everything, almost a lot. The main thing is, yes, I'm here to support the congestion prices because for one thing that you know, a lot of people have mentioned about accessibility, I thank you, but also we got to remind that people who do travel with group homes to their doctors that are in Manhattan, they use the vans, they, yes, they use cars, they need to make sure we transport them from their location, from home in Brooklyn or Staten Island into Manhattan. So please make sure we remember that there are all different types of disabilities, from wheelchairs to walkers to any types of disabilities. Not all disabilities are shown. Not every disability will be shown because some of them feel they don't need to. Please make sure that we support this all the way and make sure we support more accessibility train stations, proper sidewalk curb cuts, especially let's remind that all cars are not allowed to park in front of bus stops. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Deborah Greif, followed by Kristen Madura. Good evening. My name is Deborah Greif. I am the chairperson of the Brooklyn Family Support Service Advisory Council. That's the family who have children with developing disabilities who live at home. I am in favor of congestion pricing because the money should be used to make the MTA train stations more accessible. That includes not just elevators or escalates, but ramps. Ramps don't break down. And anyone who says, oh, we people with disabilities don't deserve to have an exemption, we do. Because you not all of us can ride or use the bus or the train because of our disabilities. So we need to make sure our system is truly more accessible and welcoming. So if individuals with developmental disabilities or other disabilities go to residential or go to a group or go to a day program or trying to go to work. If they have to use accessoride or the van and they're stuck in traffic, well, believe me, if we had congestion pricing and they others could use the trains and buses, then there would be more room. 
for people with disabilities who cannot use our inaccessible system. This also includes seniors and people with who have limited mobility issues. So I thank everybody for hearing me and keep up the funding and I want the train to be able to be more accessible. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kristen Madura, followed by Peter Mazur. Unmute, start video. Minna? Great. Hi, my name is Kirsten Madura. Um, I'm also an environmental scientist and I support congestion pricing, but believe that motorcycles should be exempt. Congestion pricing is meant to reduce gridlock, wear and tear on our roads and reduce emissions from vehicles. All three of these are reasons that motorcycles should not only be exempt, but should be embraced as a viable alternative to cars. Motorcycle, motorcycles take up only a quarter of the space that cars do, and even less if we're talking about SUVs, which make up more than 60% of our personal vehicles in NYC, and most of which are single occupant at any given time. Furthermore, if the city would legalize lane filtering during gridlock, motorcycles literally would not factor into congestion and wouldn't contribute to noise pollution from sitting in traffic. In terms of road wear, the average motorcycle weighs 400 pounds compared to more than 3,000 pounds for each sedan and more than 2.5 tons for each SUV. The physical impacts of, road, of motorcycles on road conditions literally does not even register as compared to cars, SUVs, trucks, and buses. In terms of emissions, it's well known that motorcycles emit the lowest amount of carbon dioxide than any other passenger vehicle. And even when you compare motorcycles to public buses, the emissions are far lower per occupant. NYC operates 4,373 buses, many of which run 24-7 whether or not there is a single passenger, and only 25 of those are electric, meaning the other 4,000 plus buses still emit fossil fuels whether or not anyone is on them. Motorcycles only get ridden when they're needed. In terms of the subway, the main reason we're implementing congestion pricing is to upgrade our public transportation systems. However, when congestion pricing takes place, it will encourage thousands more people to ride the already disintegrating subway systems and in the midst of a global pandemic that is showing no signs of going anywhere. If you allow motorcycles to continue their daily commute without being charged prices that are disproportionate to their impact, they will at least be that many riders who are not adding to the undue stress of the subway system that you're already trying to fix. Finally, despite public perception of motorcyclists, in reality, we are your doctors, your nurses, your lawyers, your teachers, and so on. We hate congestion as much as anyone else. The more traffic and distracted drivers, the more our lives are at risk. I personally support congestion pricing, but motorcycles do not measurably contribute to the problem and they should be treated as a solution as they have in every other global city that has implemented remarks. congestion pricing. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker will be Peter Mazur, followed by Matthew Bauer. Good evening. My name is Peter Mazur and I am general counsel to the Metropolitan Taxi Care Board of Trade, a 70 year old association serving owners, operators, and drivers of New York City's iconic yellow medallion taxi cabs. New York City's taxi cab riders have already been paying fees and surcharges to support the MTA and have paid $1.1 billion in surcharges since inception of 2009. Each passenger traveling in the congestion zone today pays $3 to support the MTA. That's more than the cost of a single fare uh, paid by a subway or bus passenger. Not only is the board responsible for raising revenue to the MTA is also charged with the uh, goal of reducing traffic in the central business district. A healthy taxi cab system helps the city and state meet that goal. Manhattan already has one of the highest rates of private vehicle, one of the lowest rates of private vehicle ownership in the country. And this is made possible in large part because of the city's robust taxi cab service. Pre-pandemic, taxi cabs moved about 300,000 passengers a day. Each taxi cab in service can move as many as 40 people a day, mostly in the core of Manhattan. Many of these riders would be using private cars if taxi cab service were unavailable or if it becomes too expensive. If New York City did not have this level of taxi cab service or if taxi cab service is priced out of the market by yet another fee, the net result will be more traffic congestion and pollution, not less. Taxi cabs are already a natural part of the congestion mitigation plan. We urge the board to exempt all taxi cabs already subject to the MTA congestion surcharge from the tolling program. This makes good sense from a congestion mitigation standpoint and makes good sense to preserve the revenue the taxi cab industry already provides to support the work of the MTA. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify this evening. Thank you. The next speaker will be Matthew Bauer, followed by Jackie Cohen.
Hi, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Matt Bauer, and I'm the and I and I am the president of the Madison Avenue Business Improvement District. Uh, as you know, Madison Avenue is one of the most storied commercial corridors in, in the city, and our district also includes major hotels and cultural institutions. Uh, our bid runs from Madison Avenue from East 57th Street to East 86th Street, and is thus crossed by the 60th Street congestion zone barrier. Uh, we're very concerned that metered curbside commercial loading zones and passenger car parking spaces just north of the congestion zone that serve our local businesses will be monopolized by delivery and service trucks and private motorists trying to beat the congestion car charge. We'd like to work with DOT and the MTA to help develop solutions for this inevitable problem. We also want to work with DOT and the MTA to ensure that businesses within our district that make deliveries across, throughout the day, both inside and outside of the congestion zone, are not charged each time they cross it. Uh, we seek more information uh, regarding the physical design and signage connected to the congestion zone barrier uh, so that the portion of Madison Avenue and its immediate side streets surrounding the barrier reads as a cohesive, pleasant, pedestrian friendly experience and not like walking through the easy pass barriers on a highway. Uh, finally, we wanna make sure that visitors to New York City staying in hotels within the congestion zone are not unduly uh, discouraged to take a taxi to shop at Madison Avenue retailers or visit Upper East Side museums due to the requirement to pay the congestion fee upon returning to their hotel south of East 60th Street. Looking forward to you with to working with you to address these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jackie Cohen, followed by Billy Freeland. Hi. All right. Um, I think I'm on. Hello, uh, my name is Jackie Cohen. I am the Director of Climate and Equity Policy for Tri-State Transportation Campaign. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. We strongly support the implementation of congestion pricing. We've always understood that congestion pricing is not simply about tolling the system, but about the toll that traffic congestion and air pollution exacts on the livability of our city and the health and well-being of our most vulnerable communities. New York must rise to the challenge of significantly scaling back greenhouse gas emissions to achieve 85% reduction and 100% net zero carbon emission economy by 2050. This goal re requires a rapid reshaping of the economy and how we view our urban environment. As one of the most climate vulnerable and diverse coastal cities, New York City must lead the way for major cities nationally and around the world. We need to act now to reduce carbon emissions from the transportation sector, starting with implementing congestion pricing. Not only will implementation be a win for environment and public health, it's a win for millions of transit riders who rely on a transit system that needs new revenue streams to fund its multi-billion dollar capital plan. While congestion pricing itself won't solve every transportation challenge our city faces, it's an integral part of a larger strategy to make urban transportation more efficient, sustainable, and equitable. Tri-State has been fighting for congestion pricing for well over a decade, and now it is finally within reach. We cannot afford to delay any longer. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Billy Freeland, followed by Elise Marrow. Hi, good evening. My name is Billy Freeland. I'm an Upper East Side resident living on East 86th Street, and I'm a member of Community Board 8. I'm testifying today in my personal capacity in support of congestion pricing. I see the consequences of congestion regularly. When I visit my parents who live in the CBD, I take the M15 bus down 2nd Avenue. And even with dedicated bus lanes, the trip is often gridlocked. NYC's buses are the slowest in the country, and yet millions of us rely on them. And pre-pandemic, for example, more than 2 million New Yorkers took the bus every weekday. The impact of congestion on bus ridership hurts families and is regressive. Bus riders stand to be the biggest beneficiaries of reduced congestion. Fifth Avenue shows why this is an economic justice issue, for example. Uh, Fifth Avenue serves 110,000 riders, 41 bus routes from all five boroughs. 
These routes connect to neighborhoods that rank high in the CDC's social vulnerability index, which means communities that are high in poverty and have low vehicle access. And Black and Hispanic New Yorkers are twice as likely to use the bus in their commutes as white New Yorkers. Now, I want to use the remainder of my time to make three final brief points. First, there is no evidence that congestion pricing will result in a park and ride effect in my neighborhood. Professor Lewis Lee, for example, has studied this. He found fewer vehicles pass through communities bordering the central business district. And in fact, traffic falls as fewer people head into the congestion zone. But even if this occurred, NYC could adopt a form of residential parking permits and dynamic parking pricing. The bottom line, though, is it seems highly unlikely that people trying to get to work will spend hours circling for parking or spend $30, $40 or more on daily parking in garages to avoid a lower congestion fee. Second, congestion the congestion charge should be higher on vehicles that cause the most congestion and emissions, as recommended by the Regional Plan Association. Third and finally, as NPR reports, everywhere congestion pricing has been enacted, it has grown in popularity after implementation. In London, it went from 40% favorability to 59%, and it reduced traffic by 15%, emissions by 16%, and trip times by 30%. Look, finally, New York City traffic is as bad as it's ever been. Gridlock completion will be devastating to our city and our recovery. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Elise Marrow, followed by Gretchen Connolly. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, that's weird. I thought you could see me too, but I don't know what's going on. Um, anyway, I everything the last person said, I would repeat the same thing. I'm a cyclist. I've been in New York for more than 23 years. And I could just uh, recall the experience of after 9-11 when they allowed cars only to come in with, I think it was more than one passenger in that zone. And it made such a tremendous difference in biking and the, the buses were just zooming downtown. And again, I'll point to what the previous speaker said about what happened in London. And I also, to going back to my other Harlem neighbor who has kids and bikes to work, he uh, and I also agree all of the entrances, all the bridges into Manhattan need to be following a congestion pricing plan, pricing plan. And all of this money should go towards improving the uh, mass transit and the buses and opening lines. And just like they've done with Fifth Avenue for that part where there's two bus lanes. It's fabulous. And, the, and I will just do one more point, which is while we're talking about this, have a dedicated electric bike, scooter, electric vehicle lane, because there's the bike lanes are way too small for everything that's on there. And I will cede my time. Thank you guys. This was a great evening. Thank you. The next speakers will be Gretchen Connolly, Felipe Castillo, Shane King, and Hunter Stump. If you are signed up to speak but have not heard your name called, please indicate this in the Q&A function. The next speaker is Gretchen Connolly. Gretchen? Gretchen, you may begin your remarks. Hi, I'm Gretchen from Morningside Heights, and I've heard lots of excuses for exceptions, and I'd like to add my personal experience to this narrative. Families need cars. We used to take our van on the Staten Island Ferry, not because it was easier, but because my family was cheap and it cost less. The idea of cars on the ferry seems unthinkable now, but when that was the cheaper option, we did it often. But I need a car for work. Same here. I have to lug gear to locations in the CBD and drive out of state for jobs. I rent, borrow, or use car share. I consider all these costs when opting to take a job, same as if it required me to fly to Los Angeles. But our healthcare workers should be exempt. I praise our healthcare heroes, but what have doctors done to deserve the free on-street parking they have now? The hospital system near me has an employee parking for $7 a day, but the free street parking due to COVID is cheaper and easier. Guess which one they choose. Carve-outs are a slippery slope, and if you think I'm being hyperbolic, just look at placard abuse. But businesses will have to pass along this cost, our streets are clogged with trucks. Surge pricing should be structured to incentivize off-hour deliveries to get more trucks off the road during the times of high pedestrian activity. I propose a $500 toll for all illegal 53-foot tractor trailers since we seem unable to actually keep them off of our roads. 
residential real estate in the CBD will plummet. I used to live near the entrance of the Lincoln Tunnel. I chose that location because of the proximity to the waterfront and a walkable commute. I left the CBD because the horns were unbearable and trying to cross the street was a life threatening experience. Less congestion and pollution make the CBD a more desirable place to live. But I'm already paying a toll for the bridge. Hey, it costs money to use things. If I buy a train to, Pe to Poughkeepsie, that doesn't entitle me to stay on until running back. All of this planning is only good as enforcement. We must crack down on illegal covers, fake paper, and defaced obstructed plates. And finally, as previously stated, while I'm against any additional exceptions or carve outs, if they do happen, I beg you to make them in the form of a rebate and not an actual preemptive exemption. Thank you so much. I appreciate all your work that you're doing. Thank you. Our next speaker is Felipe Castillo, followed by Shane King. Hello, everybody. I didn't have any comments prepared or anything like that, but I just wanted to um, share my support for the program. Everybody that's come out in support of congestion pricing seems to have um, made excellent points. Um, there don't, there doesn't seem to be any reason to have carve outs. Like the previous speaker just said, the, it is a slippery slope. I think the people that came out, uh, against the congestion pricing have not provided good enough, um, reasons to, to stop this program. And, um, I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our final two speakers are Shane King and Hunter Stump. If you are signed up to speak but have not heard your name called, please indicate this in the Q&A function. Our next speaker is Shane King. Shane King. Our next speaker is Hunter Stump. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I just like to come out in opposition of the uh, congestion charge. I'm a microscope technician who services the downtown hospitals. I live on 66 in West End, and uh, the congestion charge, the proposed charges, would add upwards of $500 in charges on a monthly basis to my life. Uh, it'll also create a pretty obvious park and ride effect right around where I live and where the barrier is. Being only six blocks from the barrier, it's inconceivable to me that if I was to be driving around looking for parking and I would dip below the barrier that I would be charged for entry or having to enter for my work and be charged additional charges to my company would result in them trying to do less business down there. And I, I just can't conceive of how this is even being proposed right now. I, I find that I mostly downtown, you see big trucks and such coming through they're delivering things downtown. They're not just driving around. They're going to continue to come through and just have higher fees that they're going to have to deal with, which will just be passed on to all of us who live in New York City. And uh, I'm just very opposed to it. I, I don't have any much more to say. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us this evening. For those who did not do so already, we encourage you to take our short survey via the QR code or link currently being displayed. The link can also be found in the Q&A section of the Zoom. For details about upcoming environmental justice webinars and how to sign up to speak at them, please visit new.mta.info forward slash project forward slash CBDTP or by calling the public meeting hotline at 646-252-6777.
As a final reminder, in addition to the public webinars, there are several other ways you can provide comments, ask questions, or make requests. We encourage the public to comment via the CBDTP website, new.mta.info forward slash project forward slash CBDTP. You may also email comments to cbdtp at mtabt.org. Send them via mail to CBD Tolling Program, 2 Broadway, 23rd Floor, New York, New York, 10004, or call 646-252-7440. The time is currently 8.51 p.m. This concludes our webinar. Thank you again for your participation.